Good morning, uh, members of the tribunal. Uh, are you ready to begin? Thank you very much. Yes, we are. Um, okay. I gather there's a bit of housekeeping. There, there is. Um, so yes. do you want me to record it? Yeah, I'm happy to Well, uh, actually, um, I, I will, uh, Mr. Hill, did you, did you have something that you announced as needing housekeeping discussion? <laughs> I'm cutting you off. Uh, no, I don't think we've had confirmation that we can upload those documents. Uh, but uh, other than that, I don't have anything. Okay, um, so uh, I'm going to uh, ask Mr. Harrison to uh, uh, go, go on video. He can explain the details better. And certainly if we're gonna start talking about uh, potential um, uh, next steps to address the situation, Mr. Harrison's gonna be the person um, manning the phone uh, to try to make that happen. So I, I would like him to join in the discussion uh, I could say uh, I understand through Mr. Harrison that we have an issue with the next witness, Mr. Viscus. Um, the, the the computers uh, that were delivered that were to be delivered, computers and um, uh, camera equipment that were uh, in route uh, that we talked about yesterday uh, have not uh, at least they have not arrived. I don't know if they're in process beyond customs, um, and I'm not sure anybody here knows, but that but uh, so they may arrive shortly, um, but they're not there now. So as we as we uh, go into this morning, we wanted to report um, a new concern in addition to waiting for the, that equipment to arrive. Um, and Mr. Biscus, as a reminder, when, uh, that we pointed out yesterday, he's the next witness. Um, because we're also dealing with reporting to our to the witnesses, including Mr. Biscus, that well, the schedule looks like it's moving back a little bit. He raised the concern that there is a uh, a 7 p.m. hard curfew. Can't be out. It's subject to arrest. Um, very concerned about having to leave the office where he was planning to do this. Um, you know, uh, at six to be home in time. You know, and and know that he's in before the cur the, the curfew and can't be out. Um, so he asked us. You know. How's that? You know, how can he? How can he wait um, at that office and and know that he could leave? Um, to address these two things, um, Brian started talking to Mr. Biscus about the fact that he has computer equipment in his home. Not the same, uh, obviously. Well, if you're if, if you're um, relaying what Mr. Harrison's going to tell us, let's have Mr. Harrison. I'm sorry, he just left. I think to take a phone call on on. Uh, <laughs> He just ran out of the room, so I'm assuming he's getting a phone call from somebody. Uh, Mr. Biscus has computer has a laptop at his house. He, and I, this is a detail, he has a phone or a laptop with camera capability also at his house. He would like to not, he would like to plan not to go to the office where he was expecting to do this, not to wait for computer equipment from FTI, but instead to plan to be at his house so he knows he's safely inside, however late this gets. Um, Mr. Harris is back, if you could come back on. Um, and that would require a workaround instead of what people are familiar with and used to for the standard 360 camera and stream. It would be a um, more limited uh, projection from some angle from some corner in the room where he's testifying to take up to, to capture as much of the, of the room around him. But that's all he can yes. offer as an alternative. One, one possibility might be that the uh, respondents would be able to arrange for an official to be present with him while he's giving his evidence. Well, we haven't raised that and whether that would be of any concern to him. So I, I don't want to speak for him and just say- No, no. He'll, but um, again, you know, the, the, until FTI gets a picture from whatever the, um, uh, a second device is uh, that he'll use as a camera to stream. Um, I can't. I can't report how much of the room is covered. Um, okay. Um, when um, if um, we could be updated uh, when we have our first break in an hour and three quarters or so um, of the position, um, and if it's possible to do some experimentation to see how the thing works. 
uh, in the meanwhile, uh, that would be a help. But anyway, I, uh, um, that, I, that, I that would be fine. I'm not, I, I don't, I, I'm sorry to speak over you. Um, so what you're saying is don't tell Mr. Biscus um, that it's agreed he can go home at some point today, stay home and wait for his, his turn to be called to wait still further where he's, he's outside his home and he was planning all along to go to another office for all, where the computer was being delivered for all this to happen. So the, the message to him right now that Brian should deliver is hold to the plan until we tell you otherwise. Can I just interject? If it helps yes. at all, if it helps at all, uh, I know I've run on a bit with Mr. Marshall, and I will be, uh, I think, up to an hour this morning. I hope a bit less, but then I intend to be quite quick with Mr. Biscuits. So I don't think he should feel worried that there's going to be a sort of two-hour cross-examination or anything like that. And I would have thought, given the time frame of the curfew, there isn't any difficulty anyway, unless unless um, Mr. Carroll intends to be much longer in redirect than is on the, the timetable. Right. Um, well, the answer is that um, Mr. Biscus should try to make arrangements for the best way of giving his evidence in the absence of receiving the equipment, which is in limbo at the moment. And whether it's at his home or whether it's at an office, uh, I don't think matters too much. He'll have time to get home uh, after his evidence, providing it's not going to take him more than an hour. Right. It, the, the office where this was expected, where the, the, the equipment is being yeah. delivered, Mr. Biscus reports as being an hour commute from his house. That is what caused him to raise a concern with Mr. Harrison. Uh, that's We're passing it on. I can't speak for him and tell him um, that Mr. Hill assures that it won't be a problem and say that then he's okay with that because he's telling us, um, I'm just reporting it. Yes, um, well, we're flexible. We want the best arrangement possible for giving his evidence. If, if that's better done uh, at the office, then we could give him a guarantee that if he's not finished, uh, we'll stop at six o'clock so he can get home. Uh, but uh, the alternative is to do it from his home. I understand Mr. Hill's got no objection to that in principle. Um, so let's leave it to him to try and sort the thing out at his end over the next hour or so. Mr. Harrison will work with them as best as possible with that instruction, Mr. President. Very well, let's move on then. Let's have Mr. Marshall back. Okay, we're bringing the witness in now. Mr. Marshall, we were, uh, I guess, go to a new document now, which is C-101, that can be pulled up. Now, on its face, this document is a minute of a meeting at the RDB. Uh, and it uh, purports to be a minute of a meeting with a junior person at the RDB, Mr. Uncubito. Now, this is not an RDB minute, is it? It doesn't look like it. No, it's prepared by someone on your side, isn't it? I believe it was. Now, there are some statements on the second page of the minute. Can we, I just want to have a look at those. And I just want to look at the law in the penultimate paragraph, the last sentence. I, I would like to correct you that Mr. Nakabita was the spokesman for the RDB at that time, not a junior officer. Well, that's not accepted, but uh, we've heard that evidence. Uh, can we look at... But uh, his business card said, and that's what he told us. Can we look at the last, the penultimate paragraph? 
it, it's recorded there uh, that uh, based presumably on what was being said to him by you at the time, Daniel agreed that this was unfair to NRD. And then we also have a statement a little lower down that Daniel said the RDB agreed that the BVG investors would be compensated because their con concession had been illegally expropriated and the state had a debt to them. Uh, that is not an accurate record, is it, or anything actually agreed by anyone on behalf of the RDB? He gave us a long explanation about how it had been illegally taken from us and they had not followed any of the administrative procedures in doing so. And it was primarily at the instruction of Dr. Michael. And you knew, didn't you, that Mr. Uncabito wouldn't have been authorized to make statements of this kind on behalf, on behalf of the RDB? I absolutely knew that he was instructed to make those statements to us by the RDB. And the RDB have never accepted, and it's not the case, that uh, the BVG investors that had their concession illegally expropriated. That's correct, isn't it? Of course not. And if that had been the case, you would have pursued a claim for the BVG investment, and you never have, have you? We had reached a gentleman's agreement on how this was to be handled at that time. Uh, Mr. Nakabito was bringing it up again because he thought it was so manifestly unfair, and he and others in um, the RDB um, we're putting together a proposal about how to compensate us uh, for that illegal uh, expropriation. And that is, the evidence you've just given is simply untrue, isn't it? No, of course not. Now, can we go to bundle uh, C100? This is a notification to Mr. Guattari under the Bilateral Investment Treaty, and you request in... you request informal consultation and negotiation. And uh, you considered at that point, didn't you? you? You had a claim based on the failure to award long-term licenses, yes? No, we, we were trying to get uh, some form of communication and we were trying every tool that we had to try to get Mr. Guattari's attention. As I said, there's only five, maybe six mining companies in the industry we couldn't understand why he was refusing to meet or even communicate with us. Well, you're articulating, aren't you, a right to consultation on the basis you have a claim under the Bilateral Investment Treaty. We were trying to provoke him into some communication with us. We were unable to get a meeting with him. So we were trying to use any tool we could, as I had been doing for three years, trying to provoke any uh, sort of attention to the problem. Could you go to C-107? This is a letter to you, or an email to you, to Mr. Neon Saba, who's going to be one of our witnesses who we'll see later. And Mr. Neon Saba is a senior representative of the ITSKI. PACT program, isn't he? Yes? Uh, no, he's an employee of PACT, um, and uh, he um, has some also responsibility to uh, the ITA, but I don't know what that is. He is no. the head of the uh, purported ISKI tagging program. Exactly. Now, let's look at the uh, second uh, paragraph. You say, Mr. the Minister of Ode continues his recent argument that because NRD does not have a long-term mining license, he refuses to uh, provide NRD with a tag manager. And you pick up the point again in the next paragraph. Obviously, the argument that he refuses us a tag manager because we do not have a long-term license is disingenuous. Now, that's a complete distortion, isn't it? Mr. Imaner's point was not that you did not have a long-term license. It was that you did not have any license, despite being asked to apply for one. We were in the same position as all the, all the uh, large-scale uh, mining concession holders. He had singled us out 
um, and refused to provide a tide manager. Tide manager is the person. No, that's that not at all an answer to my question. Let's just focus on my question. What do you say in this letter, in this email, is inaccurate? Because Mr. Imano was not refusing you a license on uh, tagging on the basis you didn't have a long term license. He was re refusing you tags on the basis you didn't have any license. Correct? That's not true because all we're all concession holders are being treated the same, except we were signaled out and not able to get tagged. We now, you know this is not an answer to my question. You know what you're digressing onto now is your no. You're you asking your right to a license. Sorry, respectfully, um, claimants claimants object to that argument and statement. I, we believe it is responsive, and we believe you shouldn't be cutting it off uh, and let them finish and make whatever arguments you want later. Well, I'd like you. you I'd let you. Finish I, I, I right. understood it to be. I understood it to be an answer to your question, Mr. Hill, well, case, which was as to what was the reason. And he was saying, as I understood it, that the others were in the same boat, but they weren't be, being denied the right to tag. Yes. Well, uh, can I re in that case rephrase my question? What I meant to say is that the, uh, and I'm sorry if I got the question wrong, what I'm trying to suggest to Mr. Marshall is that the, what's said in the letter is inaccurate because he's representing to Mr. Neon Saba that he's being refused a license, refused tags because he doesn't have a long-term license. But Mr. Imina was in fact refusing you tags because you didn't have any license, not just a long-term license, any license. And I'm suggesting the letter was inaccurate. And that's the question I'm, I'm asking you to answer. I disagree with that characterization. Now, uh, you then go on to say, in the next paragraph, we have begun legal procedures to claim against the Rwandan government for expropriation damages under the Rwanda-US Bilateral Investment Treaty. So although you say said it a moment ago in answer to my question about the consultation, you just said that was trying to provoke a reaction. You're in fact telling Mr. Neon Saba, you have begun legal procedures to claim against the Rwandan government for expropriation, aren't you? Yes. So this is, this is the same um, uh, approach that we were trying with the minister. Um, the reason, there's no instant in all of the um, activities of the ITSKI program where someone has been denied a tag for, for without being in breach of the program. We were never in breach of the program. So what I was trying to do was provoke a response uh, from Ile de France uh, uh, on the same basis that he addressed the problem. He had no right uh, to allow the minister to withhold the tax. I'd suggest to you that it's, uh, what this shows is you did consider you had a claim for expropriation because you're telling Mr. You're telling in Ile de France, who's not a member of the government, that you have that claim. Yes? Uh, no. Uh, Ile de France is, is breaking his own internal rules, and I'm trying to alert him to the fact that he, as the head of PACT, um, is, is uh, breaching the ITSKI rules by allowing us to be denied tags. We certainly expected it, it, it was um, an absurd situation. We were only people that were treated this way. We certainly expected them uh, to, to resume issuing us tags. Now, can we go over the page and look at the penultimate paragraph? You say uh, you've just, uh, you deal there with uh, staff, security per personnel and protecting the assets. And you say, for what comfort it may give you, we have not had any reports that any minerals have come into the NRD concessions from the DRC. As you know, there'd be no economic incentive for such minerals to come from the DRC into our concessions. So you were explaining to Mr. Neon Saba that from your perspective, there weren't minerals coming into your concessions from the DRC, you correct? Yes, but I have to give you the context of that. Um, he and I had been talking about whether our concessions were being used uh, as part of this large scale movement of DRC minerals coming into Rwanda. I wanted to assure him that in a quasi-custodial role, 
um, we had not seen any of that happen. It was still coming through other um, mechanisms, through other concessions, but still not through ours, even though we did not have tags. Our custodial function was working. Could you just go to your third witness statement, to paragraph 13? <clears throat> You're dealing there with the consequence of refusing tags. Can you say... Uh, in the second half of the paragraph, dealing with the claimants could not confirm who was tagging at the member concession and other concessions. Do you see that? And then you go on to say, based on these com communications, it's my understanding that minerals were being tagged as originating at NRD concessions, even though tags were denied to NRD and NRD was not conducting mining operations. In order for this, for this to happen, respondent had to be issuing tags to someone for minerals coming from somewhere. It was not NRD's minerals being tagged, and very likely the tagged minerals were smuggled from the DRC and respondent tagged them as if they originated from NRD's concessions. Now, that is uh, the opposite point to the one we see in your email to Mr. Neon Saba at the time, correct? No, uh, there's apples and oranges. We were not seeing any um, uh, tags, uh, minerals being tagged in our concessions at all. There are miners um, who live in villages in the concession and in their backyard, they are literally mining. Um, where, where the tags were coming from that were used to tag those minerals um, or, and this was in response to a request because they believe there were large scale um, minerals coming into the concession and being tagged from somewhere. So the, the general question we were being asked is by what, um, how, how were minerals from our concessions being tagged? And as far as we knew, none were. Um, and so he had to look elsewhere. It may well have been coming through our concessions, but not that we knew about. We weren't seeing signs of it. Now, please go to C38, C038. This is Mr. Imina's notification on 19th of May 2015 of the decision that the information you provided uh, uh, with your application meant that your application did not meet the requirements. And uh, what he says is references made to our letter request you specifically to submit, among other things, detailed proposals with a clear time frame for work plans and business plans for the period of licenses your company applied for, as well as proofs and documents supporting your applications. And he says, upon review of the documents you submitted, it was determined the information did not meet the requirements. And he says, considering the fact that it is for the third time your company has been requested to submit complete application files but failed to do so despite forbearance shown by the Ministry, I unfortunately regret to notify you that due to the reasons stated above, the ministry is not able to grant mineral licenses to your company, uh, NRD. And then over the page, uh, he asks you to hand over the mining perimeters. And it's right to say, isn't it, as he says in the letter, that you had been asked three times to provide complete information, correct? No, we, we, we had not. We, we had been um, asked to uh, submit additional information on, on several occasions. Um, we could not get any uh, verbal, uh, uh, normal kind of communication through a meeting. Um, so all we could do was look at, at, at interpret whatever questions were being asked. Uh, we thought that was very unfair. Um, we had fully performed, we had an application which had been reviewed, we had had an agreement which had been negotiated, um, the, the language of the agreement we had negotiated, and, and the reason this was particularly upsetting was not just that we're not willing to grant a license, we're not even willing to sit down and talk with you about either the requests for information or what the the uh, language of a long-term concession license could be. So we never even got to talk with about what covenants or representations or warranties or anything that would be 
in a long-term uh, license agreement. So we were being cut off based on a wholly new um, application process that nobody else was being subjected to. And it's, it's, right, it's, puzzling. it's right to say, as he said in the first paragraph, uh, you had not provided, as requested, detailed proposals with clear time frame for work plans and business plans for the period of the license, as well as proofs and documents supporting your application. We went through that yesterday. Correct? I, I, I take issue with it. I, I disagree that we had not provided those that information. Now, uh, can we go to C112? But this was particularly upsetting in the context that the bailiff was continuing to, uh, without documentation, plunder our assets. And we had no way of being able to stop it. So we were very upset. So you go to C112. This is a, uh, and go to the, we go to the third page of the exhibit. That's your response on the 25th of, uh, May. Now, picking up the bottom paragraph on page one, you say this notification appears to us to make little sense, given that more than one year ago, the minister expropriated the same mining concessions. So you took the position, didn't you, that the concessions had in fact been expropriated more than a year previously? No, I'm, I'm, as you can see, that's highly rhetorical. I'm trying to provoke a response from a minister, uh, Gattari, who completely refused to meet with us, although he kept telling the U.S. Embassy that he would meet at any time. Uh, I waited outside his office. Susanna waited outside. We were trying to get any basis for a conversation because unlike all other processes in Rwanda, we had simply been cut off uh, roughly about the time uh, uh, beginning with the, not being able to get tags, but then with the seizure of our, our business. Well, you're saying in this paragraph, you look at the next part of it, it was due to this appropriate expropriation and the minister's unwillingness to discuss this matter that two months ago we requested settlement negotiations. So your position quite clearly is that there's been an expropriation and you've already requested settlement negotiations under the BIT, yes? I'm sorry, it disappeared on me. Where are you reading from? Just still at the bottom of paragraph one. It was, do you see, it was due to, sorry, at the bottom paragraph of the page. It was due to this expropriation and the willingness, minister's unwillingness to discuss this matter that two months ago we requested settlement negotiations. So yep. you are uh, taking the position that there's been an expropriation and that that has uh, already prompted a request for settlement under the Bilateral Investment Treaty. Yes? Well, we were still trying to provoke him. We had no other basis on which to say, other than please help us, this was our only possible argument. So I had been using it for three years and I continue using it, really and, until 2016. And if you go on to the next page, you say the investors in, in NRD do not understand the purpose of the minister's notification letter or how it relates to the ongoing Article 23 consultation and negotiation discussions. The notification letter appears to be written as if the minister is not aware that settlement discussions are ongoing between the investors in each of NRD and Bayview Group and the RDB under Article 23 of the Bilateral Investment Treaty regarding the expropriation of the businesses of NRD and Bayview Group. And then you go on to say, paragraph three, the notification letter appears to misrepresent the circumstances. You say the fifth paragraph of the letter, notification letter states that NRD must proceed with the closure of your operations within a period of 60 days. As you are aware, the NRD mining concessions were effectively closed by the minister's actions more than 18 months ago and formally expropriated by action of the minister more than a year ago when the mines and NRD offices were, were seized. So you're making it clear that you regard the final decision by Mr. Imina as irrelevant, because as you say, the concessions have been expropriated more than one year previously. Yes? No, again, uh, you know, it, it's the only tool that I have to be able to provoke change. For example, 
uh, in June of 2014, the mines and, and offices were given to Ben Benzingi. We, we uh, point out that you know, we could have this reviewed internationally um, and, and then the government changed its mind and gave them the concessions back to us. So this is the only tool we have. We can't threaten something else. So all I can do is continue to threaten uh, that this procedure could begin um, and, and hopefully that it would provoke uh, the government into being fair and treating us like all the other long-term concession holders um, and give us the concessions. And, and, and as you know, uh, you know, it was, there was not only no handover, there was no negotiation, nobody would talk to us. We knew that they were frozen. We knew that they were undecided about what to do. And, and only in September did we get our offices back, September 2016. So we knew that there was every chance that the government was going to turn around and do the right thing. But without being able to threaten uh, some legal proceeding, they were, all I could do was either this or say, please um, give us our concession back. Can we look at item five? You say the notification letter falsely summarizes the discussions to date between NRD and the Ministry for the Long-Term Mining Licence. The third paragraph of the letter says that NRD has been requested to, to submit complete application files, but failed to do so. For many months, NRD has requested meetings or indeed any communication to discuss the so-called application files. That's the Ministry's I'm proposed talking. change exactly that. to our existing agreement. Please review the correspondence between NRD and the Minister to see why the Minister's statement is false, or at least grossly misleading. And in particular, NRD continues to ask why the 2006 agreement has been unilaterally terminated by the Ministry as represented in the Rwanda government and what compensation will be paid to NRD's investors in respect thereof. Now, we have in fact, in the last day or so, we have reviewed the correspondence between you and the Ministry. And it's fair to say that in this letter, you are not engaging with what you've been told, which is that you failed to meet to take your opportunities to provide a compliant application, correct? No, I, 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 this is a wholly new application process, as far as we can tell, created just for the purpose of, of not communicating with us um, as if a decision had been made uh, to have us lose all of our licenses and assets. You know, parallel to this so-called uh, reapplication process that nobody else was subject to, the bailiff is going around and, and uh, stealing our trucks, and I say stealing, not just uh, seizing without documentation, because we never got them back. We, we don't know where they went. We have no basis on which to know what they did with any of the equipment that they were stealing on an ongoing basis. All we could see was we came, we made an investment, and here on the one hand, the bailiff is, is seizing everything without documentation. There's no police protection. And on the other hand, there's a, an a application process, which nobody else in our category is being subjected to, and there's nobody to talk to. We get a letter, you say, here's what you have to do. Here's, here's the information we want. We provide the information as we understood it was meant, um, or that if it wasn't uh, available to us, we noted that it was in our offices. And then you come, and then without any negotiation or any discussion, which is completely contrary to any practice in Rwanda, you say you failed. And you've repeated the word failed over and over again. Mr. But it's Marshall, not true. That is that characterization of how you responded to the application and the repeated request for information is entirely unrealistic. We've seen what information you provided and what you declined to provide. We've seen that you didn't even apply on a concession by concession basis. And we've seen that you simply ignored the request to show financial substance of the people behind NRD. So it's not, it's not as if you made a realistic attempt to meet the uh, application process, is it? In my it's being years, fair. In my seven and a half years living full-time in Rwanda, I was never aware of any licensing or uh, process where information was being uh, requested by a minister or ministry which was not accompanied by uh, direct oral conversation about 
what was it that was wanted and in what format it should come. Uh, can, you, you go, sorry, can you go to your supplemental witness statement? So I mean, I mean your second supplemental, so that's your third witness statement, the paragraph 16. Now, you deal there with various dealings uh, that you say you've had with the military. Uh, and you say, although the long-term licenses should have been granted without my helping the Rwandan military, I believe that providing these services only increased my chances that NRD, in which I was an investor, would get the li licenses in a more timely fashion. The fact that I was providing these services in 2015, while the reapplication was under review by Rwanda, led me to believe that Rwanda would soon grant NRD the licenses. I did not think the Rwanda military would continue to solicit my help if Rwanda did not attend to grant the long-term licenses as they were required to do. Through my dealings with the military, I believe that Rwanda valued me as a good partner. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on this evidence because I don't accept its material at all. But just to be clear, all you are saying on this evidence is that you thought that the work you say you did with the military increased your chances. That's what you say. Yes? Uh, I was invited to Rwanda to give advice, uh, both legal and, and business advice on, a, on any number of topics. Um, by the time 2010 came around, I was asked specifically to focus on uh, procurement issues um, and issues which were of topical interest, either to the DMI or uh, to General Cabarebe um, about procurement. Um, did I think that that made me a, a suitable long-term partner for Rwanda? Absolutely. I, I thought that I, I was being complimented all the time. They would call us up for, for even administrative you know, corrections on letters that they were sending out where they wanted to have me or Zuzana check it. Um, it was still something that we were doing in addition to our charitable work to make us good corporate citizens in Rwanda. And you don't identify in this witness statement any uh, assurances or promises from the military that they were going to somehow help you with your license, do you? No, we were with them virtually every day, and they were certainly every day assuring us that we would be getting the long-term license. If you had had assurances, uh, you would have said so in one of your witness statements, wouldn't you? And you haven't. Uh, I believe I have, but, I, but I've been saying it over and over again. Well, you've been saying it over and over again in your oral testimony, but the, what you, the way you deal with it in your witness statement is here, and all you say is you believe these services increased your chances. No, I was, I, we followed instructions from the U.S. Embassy and from the uh, military personnel. From the military personnel's position, uh, the people in the mining ministry were really uh, both youngsters and or and or um, corrupt, and so they were repeatedly asking me to be patient, not to do anything precipitous, because that's not the way Rwanda works. And, and you're not suggesting to the tribunal, are you, that you thought you were entitled to some special treatment that other investors didn't get because you had some relationship with the, with the military? Special treatment? How do you yes. mean special treatment? Well, as I understand some of the arguments you're saying today, it seems to be that you thought you were especially entitled to a license, irrespective of your objective entitlement to it, as seen by the ministry. We were, we were entitled to fair treatment, and I don't think anybody disputes that. You know, we, what we were doing was trying to be good partners for Rwanda. We expected to be there for the long term. We would not have done what we did. Every step of the way, we would ask the U.S. Embassy whether we should or not. That was the reason the U.S. Embassy gave us as much support as they did. Evode was 28 years old with no, virtually no uh, geology or mining experience. He, he was fulfilling somebody's role. Uh, now, after after these letters. What that was, we don't know. After these letters, you didn't have, you, you had a number of further meetings with Mr. Emina, didn't, Emina, didn't you? Never. His position, he, you did meet with him, you and Ms. Broskovikova, and his position remained that you had no licenses and your operation should be closed, correct? After the letter of May 19th, he refused to meet with us, and his staff refused to meet with us. 
Never met him again. Can you go to R025? This is a letter sent to you uh, by Mr. Imina in June 2015, asking you to cooperate with a technical evaluation team, checking for compliance with mining uh, and environmental compliance in connection with your exit. And you didn't in fact cooperate with that process, did you? I've never seen this letter before these proceedings. It certainly was not delivered to us at the time. There was a procedure where they would call us up if there was an important letter they did with regard to the March uh, May 19th letter, they, they never called us again. We never got another communication from them, period. This letter was sent in the same way as other letters that you plainly did receive because you've exhibited them and you did receive this letter and you were aware of it, correct? Absolutely untrue. I don't, on what basis do you say we received it? There's no stamp. Do you, do, did you look at the logs? I don't believe you've even looked at the logs. You didn't indicate you knew what I was talking about before. Now, in July 2015, you instructed Norton Rose Fulbright to pursue claims against Rwanda under the Bilateral Investment Treaty, didn't you? Yes? I'm, I'm sorry? July 2015, you instructed Norton Rose Fulbright to pursue claims against Rwanda under the Bilateral Investment Treaty. No, I, I um, at the instruction or suggestion of the US Embassy, they gave me the name of uh, Norton Rose. Um, I met with him on a number of occasions to determine whether what, what our options might be and if things didn't turn around. You also made a complaint to the US Embassy in February 2016 complaining about your uh, allegedly lost investment, correct? I'm sorry? You also made a complaint to the US Embassy in February 2016, complaining that you had lost your investment, yes? I, I, I made many complaints to it. I don't recall one on February 16th. Because you've alleged in, your, in this arbitration, and you've said it again today, that you expected until the tender process in February 2016, that you would remain in control of the concessions and not lose them. But that is yeah. not true, is it? <laughs> yes, it's, well, I, I'm, I'm sorry, you're going to have to read the question because I missed it. Yeah. Uh, you have alleged in this arbitration that you expected until the tender process in February 2016 that you would remain in control of the concessions and not lose them. Yeah. That is not true, is it? No, there, there is a process by which um, if the May 19th letter had been a serious letter and not just a further attempt to negotiate, there is a, a process by which both sides sit down, um, uh, evaluations are made for uh, what contributions have been um, made to infrastructure or um, road building, uh, piping systems, uh, pumps, uh, this kind of thing, which are part of the permanent infrastructure in the local communities. That's the kind of thing that, with regard to other long-term concession holders, had been negotiated. There was a, 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 germ, a South African company which withdrew, and they went through a whole series of these negotiations. I was party to some of them, including tax issues, uh, severance issues, labor issues. Uh, we could not get anybody in the ministry to talk to us. Period. So we knew that they were undecided about what was going to happen. The military, all through this period, we were continuing to provide consulting assistance to them. On um, September 22nd, when the US, uh, Rwanda military was in the Czech Republic, that was the same day that they gave our offices back to us. So we believed that there was some progress being made, but we didn't know what it was uh, because we still had no communications. Uh, with the Ministry of Natural Resources. It wasn't until, uh, I think it's uh, the 22nd of January that we got, that Susanna got a call. I was out of the country at, at that moment. Susanna got a call uh, from a uh, deputy commander of the police uh, who instructed her, uh, made various threats of, that she would be imprisoned and instructed her to inform me that I had made very dangerous people in Rwanda very angry and that, um, and that I would be killed if I came back. Now that evidence, that was, you just, that was, just that was on that. 
that was our first indication uh, that things were very serious and it was a very different situation. The next week, uh, the government announced in um, a local newspaper, I believe, perhaps it was in February, of a, of a tender to come. And, and then I called up my connections in the military and they said, Rod, you can't come back. Now, so that's how I know. That evidence you've given about threats and similar is simply untrue, isn't it? You know, it's a terrible question and I find it insulting. Um, absolutely, we filed reports with the police, with the embassy. I was repeatedly given death threats and it's outrageous for you to say that somehow I'm making this stuff up. If you Very filed reports with the police, uh, why haven't you uh, referred to that before in these proceedings? They're with the police, they're with the embassy. The reality is what actually happened The reality is that what actually happened is that uh, Mr. Imina uh, did meet with you and Ms. Moroskova. He, he, all you were interested in was trying to get them to, to get him to change his mind, uh, and uh, he wasn't prepared to do so. And you, it was you who didn't engage in vacating the concessions. Correct? No, uh, we very much wanted the meeting with Mr. Imena. We never were able to get a meeting. If we'd been able to get a meeting, we certainly would have been trying to persuade him to change his mind. That was our objective. The worst possible scenario is for me to have to go to ICSID to try to get compensation. Right. Any, compens you any possibility of reaching some negotiated settlement was far preferable to what I'm going through now. Now, you've made an allegation, and you've repeated it a lot in your testimony, that all hard copy documents were removed from, from the Kigali office and the computer disks erased. But what's actually happened is you've been able to produce very extensive disclosure in this arbitration, including hundreds, if not thousands of documents, unsigned letters and spreadsheets, and most from the period 2005 to 2014. And you have had very extensive access to NRD's documents, haven't you? Well, that's very kind of you to suggest that that's possible. Um, in fact, um, nearly all of our uh, documents were in the office to the extent, as I've explained, we had a laptop which is capable of holding documents, many documents, many hundreds of documents. Uh, that's all we had. We didn't have any files at, at home. They were all in the office. And yes, they were all taken. And it includes emails. And, and I ask you, if, why, if, if you're complimenting us on our documents, have you not been willing to provide documents? Your access includes emails from the period to which you have access, correct? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't recall how, how well, how comprehensive those are. And uh, isn't the reality is that you have uh, invented a the idea that there's a parallel universe of documents that might have assisted your case, uh, given that the documents on the record are inconsistent with your case. No, that, that's a, I, I, you're really grasping at straws to say that. We had, no, a, we had, we had three, at one point we had 3,000 subcontractors, 300 permanent employees. This was a large, very expensive, very successful in its time business. All that disappeared. The, the, the mere handful of documents we have because they were on my uh, laptop uh, is nothing compared to what we had in the office. And, and I wish you would talk to the people who were there rather than making an announcement. We move to paragraph 40 of your witness statement. You seek there to draw a comparison in this case between NRD and a company like Rotongo to whom long-term licenses were awarded. Can you go to R107? Go to page five. Just don't pick up a point at the bottom of the page. You say that, in fact, I checked informally with the two largest mining companies in Rwanda, Rotongo Mine and Rotongo Mine. What document is this? This is, yes, you're welcome to look at the beginning. This is a letter from you to the Rwanda Revenue Authority in July 2013. Mm -hmm. 
requesting a meeting. Can I see the second page? Just to be clear, Mr. Marshall, I'm not interested in the content of a letter at the moment on the tax point. I just want to pick you up on a particular point you make in this letter about Rotongo. So you may not need to take time. You can obviously if you want, but you don't need to take time reading the letter to answer my question. Can you go to the next page, please? So have you familiarized yourself with what this letter is, Mr. Marshall? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. This is back in 2013, and I don't recollect very much from this. Uh, well, why don't I ask my question, and then you tell me if you feel you can't answer it without looking at the context of the letter. Okay. So if we, my question relates to the bottom of page five, in paragraph seven, where you talk about, uh, you say in the first paragraph of paragraph seven, I believe that because of the high investment costs for the mining industry, it's very likely that no mining company in Rwanda had any taxable income during the startup period. You then say, I, in fact, I checked informally of the two largest mining companies in Rwanda, Rotongo Mines and Gotumba Mining, and found their tax obligations after the startup period have always been less than 200 million per year. And please note, these are companies that have nearly 20 times our level of production and turnover. And that was just the point I wanted to pick up with you. Your understanding was that a company like Rotongo had nearly 20 times NRD's level of production and turnover, correct? Yeah, I, I don't know what the period was that I was referring to when I made that observation, but it's easily checked by uh, Rotongo's production versus our production. Now, can we go to paragraph 74 now of your witness statement? Don't forget, ours is a greenfield. Rotongo is a fully operational mine. Ours is ours is a greenfield site with nothing. In the west, uh, completely nothing. In the east, we had two brick warehouses, and that's all. Well, you were saying uh, the other day that Nemba was not a greenfield site, weren't you? No, it, as I say, it had two brick warehouses, and it had some tunnels, but it's not a... Uh, you can't compare it to Rotongo in terms of its operations. No. You walked in and you were fully operational, as they will tell you. No, paragraph 74. You deal there with your uh, allegation you make about smuggling. And you say a constant topic of conversation was the amount of minerals which were brought into Rwanda from the DRC and sold as Rwandan minerals. This is commonly known in the general mining community to be a very big business, and sometimes concession holders estimated to be more than three quarters of all minerals exported from Rwanda. Can we look at what Mr. Neon Saba says at paragraph 74 of his witness statement? Sorry, I don't mean 74. I mean, that's a wrong reference.
paragraph 16 of Mr. Neon Saba. Sorry, paragraph 16. And it's his supplementary. 16 of his first witness statement. He says, I disagree with the assertion made by Mr. Marsh in his witness statement that a constant topic of conversation at the Mining Investors Forum was the amount of minerals brought into Rwanda by the Democratic Republic of Congo. Throughout my time at PACT, we've worked hard to monitor and control smug smuggling, and we have been successful in doing so. This is clear, for example, from the reduction in the number of Chinese buyers operating the mining sector in Rwanda. Prior to 2011, when the Itsuki program started in Rwanda, there were a number of Chinese buyers operating the mining sector, most if not all of whom did not care whether they were buying minerals from the DRC or Rwanda. Following the introduction of the Itsuki system and after we started close monitoring, closely monitoring production and the sale of minerals, most of the Chinese buyers left. Today, there's only one Chinese buyer operating in Rwanda. And the reality, Mr. Marshall, is that you've made a number of exaggerated allegations about smuggling from the DRC and a fairer position is to be found in Mr. Neon Saba's account, correct? Well, this is a wholly fallacious statement. First of all, he's not a member of the Mining Investors Forum. He's never been to a meeting. He doesn't, I'm not even sure that he knows what the Mining Investors Forum is, uh, to be clear. Um, he cannot know what our conversations are. Um, there is, right now, to give you just, and bear with me, a very small thumbnail of, of how absurd the ap uh, accusation are, uh, his accusation is that all minerals sold in Mon Rwanda were mined in Rwanda. There's, there are maybe two companies with investment of larger than $1 million, two mining companies with investment of larger than $1 million currently existing in Rwanda. All the rest are groups of artisans who were required by the government to form themselves into a corporate entity. There are not hundreds of real mining companies in Rwanda. Two companies with something more than a million dollars in investment cannot produce $800 million in turnover, which is what the turnover in Rwanda was last year. I would say 95%. Some of my colleagues say it's 90%. Well, Mr. Neon Saba is in charge of the Itsuki program and on the ground, and his explanation of the production figures and how they relate to export figures is likely to be more reliable than yours, isn't it, Mr. Marshall? No. Now, let's move on uh, to uh, some points you make about Mr. Magisha, which is just the final area I want to cover with you. Paragraphs 28 and 29 of your second supplemental statement you alleged that at NRD's formation, it retained Mr. Magisha's firm, Trust Law Chambers, as corporate counsel, and that NRD negotiated a settlement with Mr. Ben Benzingi in 2008. Now, you weren't around of NRD in 2008, were you? So you're not actually in a position to give evidence about what about those, those alleged negotiations, correct? Uh, that's what our records show had happened, and that's what we were informed by subsequent uh, legal counsel. Now, Mr. Magisha explains the position in his uh, witness statement uh, in response to the claimant's removal application that this is not correct and that in fact, trust law was acting in 2008 for the Zarnax. That's fair? Or would you not know? Not that I'm aware of, but I understood that they were acting for the company. Now you then allege paragraphs 30 to 33. Company, not the Zarnax, by the way. You then allege at paragraph 30 to 33, that after you acquired NRD in December 2010, you continued to rely on Mr. Magisha and trust law chambers and did so until at least June 2014. And the meeting in June 2014, you say, was to discuss the taking of uh, NRD's offices in Kigali by Mr. Benzingi. Now, you haven't produced a single note or diary entry, or email, or SMS message, or telephone record, or anything to support your allegation about Mr. Magisha's engagement by NRD in this period, have you? Uh, I don't recall. Well, you haven't produced anything. And the reason for that cannot be anything to do with not having documents in the office, because you re refer to a, a meeting in June 2014, which was after the bailiff seized the Kigali office, wasn't it? 
I, I am surprised that he's denied that the meeting happened. And if uh, Mr. Magisha really had been acting as counsel to NRD, then Norton Rose would have been unlikely to have approached him to be an independent legal expert in the proceedings, wouldn't it? Would they? Uh, that's not a conflict that I would appreciate the significance of. Uh, thank you, Mr. Marshall. Over to you, Mr. Cowley. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Marshall. Uh, uh, well, FTI, I'm going to ask you to call up R100. Mr. Marshall, do you recall Mr. Hill's questions to you on Monday about this document and his suggestion to you that your witness statement concerning Rwanda's solicitation of an investment from you was inaccurate? I, I recall that he was asking uh, questions about that, but I don't recall the questions themselves. Uh, do you recall giving a witness statement or in your witness statement, do you recall talking about how your initial uh, investment in Rwanda came to be, who initiated discussions, et cetera? Yes. Um, and uh, do you recall Mr. Hill questioning you and suggesting to you that regardless of what you said, in fact, you were the first person to propose any investment in Rwanda, not the other way around? Do you recall that? I, I recall his him asking that and um, my, I don't know what the record shows my answer is, but certainly it was not me that initiated that process. Well, my, my question to you is, what discussions, if any, did you have uh, regarding the potential investment in Rwanda preceding the email that's been marked as R100? What discussions do I recall? Yes, I'm sorry if I'm not speaking clearly. What discussions do you recall having, if any, yeah. about potential investment in Rwanda yeah. that were prior to the August 24, 2005 email that's been marked as R100? Yes. Uh, I was being called uh, every week, sometimes twice a week, by Lambert and others um, at the REAPO, which then became the RDB, because um, they were very anxious both to get technical support. Uh, they've been told by USAID and the State Department that I could help them on a cost-effective basis and that um, they um, had been tasked uh, with finding U.S. investment for Rwanda because Rwanda was by far the largest per capita recipient of U.S. Um, uh, foreign assistance, uh, including military assistance. Um, the first communication about the possibility that you uh, might uh, assist with or, or yourself be um, a U.S. investor uh, in Rwanda. Uh, who was that communication with? Um, that would have been with uh, Williams Nkurunziza, who I believe is the current Rwandan ambassador to England. Um, uh, I met him. Uh, with USAID people um, in Boston at a series of presentations that they were doing to try to att attract US investment to Rwanda. Who raised the request that you consider investing or helping raise investment in Rwanda? Well, USA USAID asked me to go to that meeting um, in Boston uh, to meet with these Rwandan officials and see if I could be helpful, um, particularly uh, their particular focus was on sovereign debt financing, where Rwanda had been pushing them for assistance. Um, and they introduced me to them. Um, at that meeting, um, 
uh, Williams uh, pushed me to find U.S. investors for investments in Rwanda. And when was the first discussion that you might be or lead investors in Rwanda? That it would have been at that meeting that Williams was was um, pushing me very hard to pull together U.S. investors to come to Rwanda as a part of my um, assistance to Rwanda. I'm going to ask FTI to go to document C-139. That was, I, I, I think it was April 2003, but I'm, I'm, I can't be sure. Um, do you recall being asked questions about this document, <clears throat> excuse me, by Mr. Hill earlier in the week? Um, I, yes, but I don't remember what the question was. That's fine. But uh, this uh, email uh, that's dated December 12, 2006, um, at, at least, at, uh, I'm sorry, that's the only email. This email that we're looking at, December 12, 2006, uh, is, uh, says in the from line, L-M-U-C. -L L M U C Y is I is I best I could read it. That's Do you the, recognize that? Yes, that's Lambert Mucho. Uh, his brother was the then uh, Minister of Justice, as I recall. Um, he was working for Riepa, uh, the RDB, um, and uh, he was the one tasked, as I understood it, uh, with pushing us to come and invest in Rwanda. Okay, now just so uh, can you, I'm not certain, and if I'm being redundant, I apologize, but I'm not certain it was ever explained what those acronyms were. So just quickly for the panel, what uh, are you referring to as REAPA? Uh, REAPA is now the RDB, it's the Rwanda Investment and Export Promotion Agency. And what does RDB stand for? Rwanda Development Board. When did when did you first begin communicating with uh, Lambert Muccio? Um, after Williams had, uh, who had led the delegation to Boston, went back. Lambert contacted me uh, by telephone and said uh, Williams has asked me um, uh, to uh, encourage you to come and invest. His focus was on investment. At, at, at about the time of this uh, email, well, this is December 12, 2006. Compared to this email, how long before did uh, discussions with Lambert Muccio begin? In 2003. <clears throat> in, as of the time of this email in December 2006, what was your understanding of Mr. Muccio's position with RIEPA? Um I would guess that he was in charge of uh, investment promotion. So he would have been, he had a staff of people uh, and he and they uh, together were contacting foreign investors to come for investment. Uh, he knew about the work that I was doing uh, on uh, giving legal and, and business uh, advice. Um, although he was not the recipient of that work that was for other people. His job was to promote investment, and that's why he kept calling us up. Uh, I'm just asking you to focus again on the from line. You'll see, in addition to what I believe I read at the beginning, in terms of his the initials for his name, um, it says it's a Yahoo.com account. Do you see that? Yes. I don't think any any government agencies had private account uh, had government accounts at, at this time. Everybody used private accounts. At any time, uh, had, did anyone uh, ever express to you a concern about you writing to or receiving from uh, government employees uh, emails at using their personal address? No, it was expected. This is very much a state of flux. The, the war with Congo had ended in 2003. 
Um, and now they were focusing on economic development. Over the last couple of days, Mr. Hill made a number of statements to you concerning what he says you must have expected based on reading various documents that he was looking at and asking you to look at at the time. Uh, do you recall those statements in Mr. Hill's questions? Um, I, I, I recall being irritated that I was um, had not added additional language, but I, I, I'm sorry, I, I would have to be asked one by one. A little bit different. I'm sorry, I asked a poor, poorly worded question. Uh, do you recall from time to time in Mr. Hill's questioning to you, he made statements about what he thought was reasonable for you to believe or expect based on a written document? Yes, in virtually every question. Now, I'm going to ask you to look at the content of C-139. Did, did a message like this from what, if any, effect uh, did a message like this from uh, Lambert Muccio have on your expectations of the importance of the written documents and policies and letters compared to conversation? Well, I, I knew both from this letter, but I knew it before that uh, Rwanda was trying to find its legs and um, uh, had you know, an official procedure, but, but then they had uh, an entirely separate procedure on how things actually got done. Not in every case, but in, but in many cases. That's why, that's why here, for example, he's, he's saying, look, you don't have to go through the, the uh, REAPA, just write to the Minister of State in charge of, of water and mines. That was not an unusual example uh, for how they were running the government at that time. And did it raise any con concerns for you to follow Mr. Lambert's uh, advice on how to pursue uh, a, a potential uh, investment in a concession compared to whatever written policies there may have been from, with, re with regard to privatization or REAPA generally? No, it, in, in fact, it was reassuring to me because um, it, it meant that it was not going to get stuck in some oblique administrative process that, that people really were making sure that the things that needed to get done got done. Um, what was your understanding about the concession process? How an inv investor or potential investor, uh, what process, I should say, a, 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 an investor or potential investor would follow in order to acquire a concession in the mining industry? What, what was your understanding? Well, it was sort of what I was referring to, and maybe inartfully uh, with Mr. Hill, um, the, the political um, decision uh, in Rwanda was that they needed investment as quickly as possible because um, as a practical matter, the economy was on its knees. The, the war with Congo had just ended, although you know Congo resources had been able to pay for much of the war, the Rwandan economy was in a shambles. Very few companies operating, very few jobs available. It's improved somewhat, but not a great deal. Uh, so they had to do very practical things. Um, and that was the basis on which they went to the investors and said, look, we need investment. We need it now. We don't want to wait uh, for a long-term mining license act uh, pursuant to which we can negotiate uh, some uh, details. We, we need you guys to start hiring people, to start functioning, to start operating immediately. Um, and please uh, accommodate us. Please help us. Uh, absolutely, you'll be getting the long-term concession license. And, and it was on that basis that we and all the other uh, investors at that time made the investments they did because it was at the specific request of the Rwanda government. Um, and in terms of pursuing, the, well, this this suggests that uh, what you might, what step you might take um, uh, in order to pursue an investment in a Basisero uh, concession. And we know from your testimony there was a period of time when BVG did have 
of the Bezesro con concession. What's, what steps did you take, high level generally, but in, uh, in, in briefly, uh, what was done by, uh, by you to, uh, uh, to pursue and obtain the Bezesro concession? What procedures did you follow? Um, they, they came to us and they said, look, here, here's a list. Um, uh, they, they were at that time, Redemi was the state um, uh, agency which held all of the large scale um, uh, mining concession uh, licenses. Um, so they, it was like a, it, it was a state company. It, 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 all the properties were in the name of the state and they were identifying suitable partners for each one. And um, uh, I don't know what the political calculations were. It was not explained to me. Um, but in the end, uh, the, the ones that I had been looking at, as you can see in this list, Route Zero, Gatumba, Nemba, and Mara, those were, those were entities that, that the state agency had, had said, look, these are particularly attractive. Won't you um, uh, apply for, for these? We will help you. You don't need the mining experience. We have hundreds of years of mining experience here on the ground, um, but we need somebody uh, to bring assets, to bring uh, uh, liquidity uh, in order so that we can do what we know how to do well. Um, those, those licenses were, were chosen for other people, right? And I never knew what those calculations were and they weren't explained to me. What they did was they said, look, uh, we would like you to, to take the Cessero. It's large, it has um, some good deposits, very spread out, um, very poor. Um, uh, it would enable you, you've asked to be able to do some uh, charitable works. Uh, that would be a suitable location for that activity as well. Uh, so uh, we would like to offer this to you um, and, and please start bringing economic activity as soon as you can. And, and we promise you, you'll have the long-term concession. From the day one, you'll be treated as long-term concession holder, which is a defined term by statute. Um, but the agreement will have to come later because we're not organized to be able to give it to you now. And I and other, uh, the other entities who also became concession holders um, uh, accepted that uh, indulgence. Okay, now, did you take steps to raise investment? Yes, I, I went back and um, uh, worked out with family and friends and, and people that I knew. Um, and we once, well, sorry, once we had been awarded the concession um, by uh, active cabinet, um, then I began collecting funds, my own funds um, and funds from other people uh, that I know personally, all of them. Um, and explain the story and why I thought that this was not just a good investment, but a good thing to do. Um, and I came back here to Boston and, and we started, uh, myself and others associated with our group, started collecting uh, mining and mining support equipment uh, for, for shipment over there. And was, uh, was the entity that you used to do that, is that BVG? Yes. Um, now, in terms of the, the, the process, that, sorry, we created BBG uh, just for this purpose. Thank you. Uh, in, in terms of the process that you described, and I asked for it at a high level because the Bicesaro actual negotiations and details of them, um, I'm not trying to get into because it's not ultimately an issue in this case. But in your, do you recall that in your uh, uh, answers to questions from Mr. Hill, you talked about what was being discussed in certain letters was not the, you, sometimes you use the word collaborative or sometimes you use the word discussions uh, that were typical um, as, as a process. Um, I would like you to explain what you considered from as your experience in obtaining the possessor concession, that process to have consisted of that you called collaborative or discussive. Uh, what was it actually? Um, uh, there, I, 
I'm embarrassed to say that I, I can't remember the, the last name of the man who was the, the head of Redemi at that time, but it will come back to me. Um, he gave, we, we, when I, I went numerous trips to Rwanda to talk about this and to give other uh, ad hoc advice on issues that were problematic for them at the time, but, which we'd had some experience in. Um, the meetings that I had at Redemi, which was the state um, agency which owned all the concessions. Um, it was being run by a, a, a very senior uh, geologist, um, a very charming guy, very reassuring, walked me through the process, um, explained that not only did we uh, not have mining experiences, um, but at that time, none of the companies who were coming to invest had mining experience. Um, uh, Rotongo people, it was, they're a defense manufacturer. Um, H.E. Stark um, is, a, is a refinery, doesn't do mining anywhere in the world. Um, we were all coming into it, even the biggest entities were all coming into it with the understanding uh, that we were accommodating um, a country in need and, and we thought both that we were doing the right thing and that they were providing the technical expertise uh, to be able to assure us we were going in the right direction. But of course, we would bring in geologists and other mining experts as the process went along. Um, so no, there were no mining companies among us. Um, they were all investors, uh, as I say, defense manufacturer, a mining process, a min minerals processor in H.C. Stark. Um, uh, Zarnax were a plumbing company from Germany. Uh, so they were looking for what they saw as good and vital partners who would have the interests of the country first. Um, and we just, just to reorient you just to reorient you slightly and I appreciate your description of who was involved in their own processes. but focusing on the answers to Mr. Hill's questions where you uh, suggested that, in some of the written documents, what was being asked or described to you is what you needed to do. You said was not the process as you knew it typically, the collaborative or uh, process of discussion. And I'm just asking you to describe not the details of what was said and what terms you negotiated about the CESRO, but how the process worked that you characterized as contrary to what you saw in letters about your NRD process. What was your, your, your experience with the typical process? Please describe it. What did it include? Whenever there, there is, this is a very small community. So what was most surprising to us about the later negotiation was that there was not um, uh, the kinds of discussions that had started from the very beginning. And it's those discussions which gave us the reassurance that this was gonna be a, a a, a mutual effort, you know, that, that it's not a, a process of confrontation. Ah, oh, you, you failed because you didn't have this uh, toilet in such and such a location. It was never like that. It was never like gotcha uh, until much later uh, when obviously other, I think, political factors had come into play. Sticking with what it was, I, I apologize to interrupt my, your answer to my own question, but I, but I, I wasn't trying to change, broaden the scope of the question by, by uh, uh, letting you know when you use these terms. I, I'm not trying to talk about those other letters yet. I don't want to be that repetitive because we'll come to some of them. Just what was your experience with what you characterize as the collaborative process? Can you describe some of the collaboration that went on in connection with obtaining the Bessessero con uh, concession? What did it involve? There was no, there was, virtually no discussion about what we should or needed to do. Um, uh, it was their assurance that they would provide us with all the technical support and um, manpower. And uh, th 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 these are hard mine, uh, hard veins to mine. And, and they have been doing it for a hundred years. They know how to do it. Nobody can do it better than them. Um, people do make mistakes. That's why you do have to have supervision. That's why you have to have personal protective equipment. Um, but it was always a, 
uh, friendly and uh, this is how we need to get this done as if we became part of the system, not as if we were somebody to be regulated from afar. Now I'm going to ask um, uh, FTI to bring up C68. This is the stock purchase agreement with Spalina. Again, I, I only want to remind everybody that there's, there's a non-disclosure agreement with, with regard to these for purposes of whatever publication comes later. Yes. Okay. Um, over the course of the of the uh, of your questioning over the last couple of days, there was a handful of times where various tax liabilities um, of the Stark and pre-Stark era were were mentioned, and I just would like to try to, as opposed to just go into all the topics that were being discussed when those issues were raised, I'd like to just focus on trying to clarify uh, and describe the various types of tax liabilities you came to find out over time um, were owed or claimed to be owed. Um, so as of this time, when you're still in a position of negotiating the deal and hadn't uh, come into uh, ownership of NRD in any capacity, um, what did you understand to be referred to as these uh, uh, tax liabilities that were accepted from this representation in the certificate? There, there were two categories. Uh, the, the only tax liabilities that I am aware of were uh, from the Stark period. They were Stark had made the argument, look, they're, they're contractors. They're, they have no expectation of collecting social security ever from Rwanda. Uh, there was lots of speculation that that the Rwanda tax office was, was just being aggressive in, in trying to claim for taxes that weren't actually due. But whatever that was, that was one issue. The other related issue was uh, for, uh, and, I, and I don't know the genesis of it, but the, the tax office made the claim that you've paid casual workers, in other words, for, you know, the, the function in, in many of the mining areas was that you would make a, a payment to somebody for doing a specific thing, like cutting the grass around um, uh, the headquarters office. Okay, well, well here's, here's 500 francs. And, and the, the person who gave him the 500 francs would write down, I, I paid 500 francs, but he didn't take down the name of the person who he had paid that money to. And the tax office was arguing with Stark that those people also should have had social security tax deducted from those casual payments. And all of them were very, very small, but it added up to a real number um, over the course of several years. Um, Stark is an exceptional, conscientious uh, German company, uh, really have a first rate reputation um, they, I am, uh, from everything I knew about them, they never were trying to do a tax dodge. This was a legitimate dispute between the tax office and NRD. Uh, by the time we got there, um, they, Anthony Ellers, when I met him, and I say I, I met him in, I think, July or maybe August, we started cooperating together in this cooperation in late August, early September. Um, he always explained this as, as something which was not a serious dispute um, and that there really was no obligation to the tax office. So um, for reasons I don't know, he signed an, uh, uh, an acknowledgement that there was a tax due of, and I forget what the number was, um, uh, but we went to the tax office it, it, oh, immediately before Tony Ellers left for, for Christmas. He signed this letter without permission from the company. Um, we asked the tax office, they said, oh, of course, no, that's not binding. Uh, we'll come in and do a proper audit to determine whether there's a tax liability or not. Um, fine, please do. Um, uh, for reasons which I don't know, the tax office was repeatedly delayed in, in bringing uh, that audit. They did some perfunctory work, but it was not a proper audit. Um, again, we're still talking about the period 
2008 to 2010, not, not before and not after. Um, we, and, and that's why these numbers seem so absurd to us because there's hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, so when we got there, uh, they asked us to make a tax. So um, this is January, 2011. Um, uh, we've arrived after Christmas. Uh, they said, please pay, pay a deposit of 100 and, and I, to get 120,000, 140,000, something like that, which we did. Um, and the same principle with the social security office, roughly the same amount of money. With the expectation that they're gonna come in and make a determination of whether any amounts are truly due. Um, as far as we know, uh, certainly they never did an audit to be able to make that determination. Um, two years had gone by, they had sent staff over periodically. They did not complain that our staff were not cooperating. Uh, there was just, uh, I don't know if it was a lack of capacity or the wrong people who didn't have the skills, something was going wrong. Um, after two years, we sat down with them and they said, look, you know, we are willing to agree that you hold on to our deposit, um, but you've got to do a real audit. You've got to exa understand exactly what these amounts are and whether there really is a tax due. And, and they agreed and they said, fine. But that was 2014. And so with, with Ben Benzingi's claims of owning the company, everything froze. We never had any further negotiation. They said to us, and I think you'll have to ask Susanna, I think if we have it in writing, um, please come back to us when the issue of whether you own the company and you own your licenses is real or not, and then we'll resolve the issue. We'll come and do a proper audit when you have your offices back. They were auditing the books that were in the offices. We didn't have them. Um, so I want to pick that apart just a little bit so that we actually have the, the time frame of what you just covered just a bit, little bit clearer. So if you bear with me, I just have some very specific questions. You said that uh, you arrived in Rwanda in January 2011. Did I hear that correctly? After the purchase, we, we purchased it December 23rd, 2010, NRD. And we arrived after Christmas, I, I, I would, the second week of January, for example. So she meant you arrived at NRD in January 2011 to, as manager of the company and that, at, at that time. Right. This if, was an even NRD. Bicicero continued, BVG continued on its own. There was no problems with that. This was a specifically an NRD problem from the Stark period. I understood. I'm just saying. That the acquisition happened in 2010, but you right. came into the company right. as manager on right. the ground. Right. Is what you're to referring to? Yeah. Okay. And you mentioned Mr. Ellers leaving at Christmas. I just want you to be very clear. Mr. Ellers left NRD for for Christmas in that intervening period, Christmas 2010, or a different year? Well, he, he left um, late November. He had some health problems and had to go to South Africa, as I recall. So he was I'm asking to put a year on. In 2010, uh, November, he had to go to South Africa, but he, he stopped off in Bratislava to um, talk to me and uh, other uh, of our investor group to push us to invest in this company. Did he ever return to NRD? No, he never returned to the NRD offices because then we found out about uh, his illegal conduct. Just trying to put a time frame. All I'm focusing on right now is the time yeah. that, uh, that these discussions happen. Right. Now, you after, mentioned after two November, issues. He never returned. You, you mentioned two issues. I just And then you also mentioned, you went further and mentioned discussions about resolution of them and where they stood. I just want to, I'm just trying to slow down to, to bring clarity to this because we talked about it at different times, I want to make sure everybody's clear that uh, how they all fit together in, in what you described. So, yes. so please just bear with me. Um, the you, you mentioned having discussions uh, with the tax office about the uh, casual workers issue and making a deposit. What time period did that discussion have? The, excuse me. Did that discussion occur? I. I I believe it would have been in January 2011. Okay. 
And was a deposit made at that time? Yes. Whose money? My money, our money. Our being who? Our, sorry, the NRD investor group. And through what entities? So in other words, your investor group, the same group that was BVG? Yes. And did, did you put that money in using the same spot on a stock ownership that you talked about with Mr. Hill on the first day when you covered these, the topic of this purchase? As investors, we were making periodic contributions out of our pocket and, and, and to the company, and, and we kept it straight among our group. Um, at, at, this, at this time, when you had the discussion in January 2011, is that also the time, approximately, when the deposit was made? Yes. Now, you said there was the Social Security issue, the expats, um, and um, that you said there was also a deposit of a similar amount um, made to the Social Security office. Yes. Um, uh, to hold for, for final resolution, correct? Yes, correct. Um, what time period? Uh, it was also January, may have been February. We, we were um, trying to understand the financial condition of the company. And there were some of these big ticket uh, bills that had to be paid right away. And uh, was the, the deposit made that you that the social security office and you talked about yes it's it, the deposit is made in the name of nrd at the social security office approximately what time uh, what time period in in january february 2011 okay and who who made the deposit what money was used whose money it would have come from it, the money came from myself and the other investors um you talked about having discussions that continued on these tax uh, issues through 2014. And you talked about how the tax office left it with you about coming back when you had certain in, uh, information or, or an ability to say certain things. We've covered that. But the question I would like to ask you, and please answer focusing on this. Um, did you ever go back have the discussions with the tax office at any point in time and resolve either of these issues? Uh, we, we went back many times. Um, the, 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 they're not good at audits. Uh, they don't have uh, capable staff who do them in a way that would be acceptable to a, a, a European or American company. Um, they know the shortcomings. They 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 know that things had to be improved, and they are upgrading their skills. Um, so that was really the reason that that it it took so long. They held on to our money, our deposit during this whole period, but no, that audit did not take. Those audits did not take place in a professional manner. Little pieces of them did, um, where certain information was established. But, but not uh, to resolve the, either of those issues. Mr. Marshall, I'm gonna apologize. I asked a, poor, a poorly worded question because I was trying to accept that the discussions continued through 2014 where you brought us in the answer to a prior question in which the tax uh, uh, department from uh, in, in Rwanda said, you can only come back and talk to us when it's clear right. that right. you own the consent. So after that, did you ever have any further discussions no about resolving these tax issues? No, no. What happened to your money in both, in both escrows? In, in, they're in they're both still the there. They're still there. Well, unless they've absorbed them, <laughs> they still have our deposits. Uh, Mr. President, I wonder if this would be, well, I could tell you from my, what I plan to ask, I'm, I'm gonna be uh, moving on to a different question than, than those two accounts. So this might hey, be well. appropriate time. Good time to break. We'll break for half now. Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and open up the breakout rooms right now for everybody. OK, 
Okay, there's Mr. Kelly. Okay, uh, Mr. President, I'll go off camera. The witness is in the waiting room, just waiting for your word to bring him back in. Mr. President, we can't hear you. Try that. Um, yes. <clears throat> is any more housekeeping to be done in relation to what's happening in Rwanda at the moment? Uh, you, you okay explaining it? Sure. Yeah, um, I'm going to ask Mr. Harrison, who's had the discussions, communications with Mr. Biscus, to report on that because uh, he could be specific. I can. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Biscus has been in touch with uh, FTI to set this up so that he can do this from his office, um, where I, I understand and I'm waiting for confirmation that the this, the curfew issue is not a problem. I am waiting for confirmation. Uh, FBI was testing the equipment so that there would be a two camera setup, one on him like we are all seeing now, and then a second one in the corner of the room to uh, serve a similar purpose to the 360 camera. Um, I uh, understand that those tests are underway or have taken place um, and that he will be ready to go when the time comes for his testimony. And we and the timing concern that we said before that's resolved. I believe so. I'm waiting for confirmation from Mr. Biscus that that the the timing concern is completely resolved. Uh, I believe that's the case. I just need confirmation from him. Well, that sounds satisfactory. Let us proceed with uh, Mr. Marshall. Um, right. We are bringing the witness back in. Thank you. I shall proceed, sir. Uh, Mr. Mr. Marshall, um, if, uh, FTI, if I could ask you to bring up Mr. Marshall's supplemental witness statement. Um, can I add that on reflection, there were many things happening when we first got back to um, our, uh, the, the company compound. It may well have been the payments, deposits were made to uh, the tax office and the social security office in February, not in January. Same year though, 2011. Yes. Thank you for the clarification. Now, if I could ask, uh, please scroll to paragraph five. Mr. Marshall, I'm just going to give you a chance to reorient yourself. Uh, Mr. Hill asked you some questions about the representations in this paragraph of your witness statement. If you recall being asked questions about the um, write-off of liability by BVG. Right. Yes. Um, and, uh, and Mr. Hill suggested to you that you made it up and you denied it. And I'm going to ask you, uh, therefore, what some of the particulars are that you are referring to. I'm Where sorry. Starting? Tell me again. Yes. I had that right. Okay. So the, the, the minerals, please explain what these minerals were, where they were, and over what period of time they were collected and put there. We began mining in, uh, we had a, uh, the, we began doing artisan assist uh, mining. Um, immediately after we got the BVG license at the Cessero. Uh, so that would have been, uh, you know, it would take s some period of time to do the transition over from the state running those activities to we had uh, local staff uh, taking that, that responsibility. And that's, that's early 2007. 
So between 2007 and 2010, uh, we were collecting mi minerals. We, we did not sell any minerals. Um, I, 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 now I talk it up to ex inexperience, but um, we kept them and I believe that things were safe when they were locked up in Rwanda. And I didn't know how, um, I, I didn't understand that things can get stolen or lost or whatever can happen in, in, a, in a poor environment. Um, so we hadn't sold any minerals. Uh, as BBG. Specifically, you said NRD management at that time. Who, what individuals, if you know? Well, it, it would have been Anthony Ellers and his CFO, a guy named Julius Cabrera, who, who we also okay. fired. Okay, I, I understood. Now, the- Oh, I'm, uh, I, haven't under, I haven't understood, I'm afraid. What is the nature of the liabilities on NRD in relation to minerals. If I could ask to scroll down to paragraph six. There's a Can you help me? <clears throat> and I'm not asking for names, but who today owns the shares in Spalina? The same group. You and others, is that right? Yes. When did the others acquire their shareholding? Uh, from the beginning. Sp Spalina, we, 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 we reactivated Spalina in, uh, so this transaction was in December, in, so it would have been reactivated in December. I, I don't think it was ever in, in um, in bad standing, I think it was it was uh, I'd been paying the fees, but um, uh, just not uh, it didn't have any business activities. But as you know, companies are expensive to start, and so I just left it. Um, you know, as I say, like a like a shell company available for for use for another project, and and well, that's the reason I brought it into this project. When it was originally formed, who owned the shares in it? Originally, it was me who owned the shares uh, when it was doing real estate projects. Um, no. The other shareholders would have signed shareholder agreements um, at about this time. I don't, I, I don't recall. Sorry, which time, which time are we talking about? When we acquired uh, uh, NRD. Well, that, that, that was the question I was asking you. When did your investment colleagues become owners of shares in Spalina? At the time of the transaction. Uh, and they became registered shareholders? They, 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 it's not a register, it's, a, uh, it's, an, it's under the Delaware LLC statute. And so they, they just sign that, they, that they're but the term, there's a memorandum of association and they just signed that. That's, that's the only indication. So, so you made over part of your shareholding to them? Yeah, that's right. Everybody became a shareholder in that entity as well. Yes. Yes. Same, and, same like as Bayview. All right. And what proportion of the shares were transferred to them? Uh, the same proportion as in Bayview and it depended it, it changed over time, depending on what contributions were made by who, when. So it was not a static um, amount. Yes, thank you. It's a, it's a running balance. Are, are, are we, is the tribunal okay now moving on to C68 again? Yes, please. Thank you. I, um, if I could ask that um, C-123 and C-124 be brought up. Just quickly looking at them to see, do you recall testifying about them already? Mr. Hill asked you some questions about these documents. Just want to reorient your memory, your yes. the focus on the topic that's discussed here. 
yes. if you recall that that what's being talked about here is the, the transfer of Bayview Group uh, hard assets um, that was part of the uh, investment in uh, in NRD that's been identified in our papers in our position. Do you recall that? I recall these documents from our earlier discussion. Yes. Okay. Now, at the time, these, these are these are the, the mirror images. These are documents that are signed as resolutions, one by um, uh, uh, one on behalf of BVG, one on behalf of Spalna. Correct. Right. And they're referring to the same event, just the, the two different corporate sides of it. Correct. Right. Okay. So, what was your position with BVG in March? 2012. I was the president. Um, who, uh, who was the? Who were the directors? Uh, other shareholders. Oh, I, I don't know if I was a. I, I may have been the sole director at this time. Hold on. Well, this me is the sole director, so I guess that's your answer. We had we had different different directors at different times, but at this time I was the sole director. What was your position with Spalina? The same. Um, do you recall Mr. Hill insisting in his questions that if these documents were actually signed at the time, you would also have to have contemporaneous purchase and sale documents relating to the transfer? Do you recall those questions? I recall the question. When you did prepare these documents as resolutions by yourself as sole director for the two companies. Were you looking to document any terms of representations, uh, liabilities, uh, limitations on liabilities, or any other terms and obligations between your company BVG on the one hand and your other company Spalina on the other hand that you thought might go into a purchase and sale document? No, I, I felt it was unnecessary because we own both. I, I'm sure we prepared one. I'm sure one exists. I, if it hasn't been produced, I, I don't know where it is. It may have been in the office. But, but uh, it, it would have been for internal purposes only, not as a matter of a negotiated agreement. I would be negotiating with myself. Are you asking what the contents would have been? I'm, I'm off that. Just hold on. Um, do you recall in uh, in the line of, of questions about this uh, uh, this acquisition time period um, at, where uh, Spalina acquired uh, the holding company? You uh, came to NRD and uh, uh, and took over as head of the company, um, that he drew, he drew your attention to Mr. Sindagaya's um, witness statement in which Mr. Sindagaya was critical of your decision at the time to fire Mr. Ellers, who was described as having experience in mining and then critical of who you did hire and their experience. Do you recall that question? Yes. Um, First of all, what, at the time you made that decision, what mining experience were, were, as far as you understood, was Mr. Ellers bringing to the table to the company? None. He was bringing management, so-called management experience. He had no experience what, in artisan mining. With what type of mining did he have management experience? Uh, as far as you understood. Well, as he expressed it to me, he, he'd been working at large scale gold mining of very complicated, very uh, small grade gold mining uh, uh, concessions in South Africa. So he would, be, he would be an employee among many hundreds of employees. Um, why did you fire? Mr. Ellers um, at that time. 
because money was missing from the company, he didn't have any explanation for it. Um, we, uh, it, it wasn't so quick. Um, we did a, uh, we had somebody, uh, Bill Kwam, who had some uh, criminal investigatory experience. Um, we found some of the um, staff had been beaten by him, um, had been forced into prostitution by him um, uh, at a house at, there's, a, we had two rented houses at Deutsche Welle um, and there were credible allegations based up, based, uh, supported by affidavits. And so we, we, uh, we formed a committee and the committee decided that um, uh, on reviewing the uh, criminal allegations that he be fired. To be, to be clear and to be specific, was this a decision in, in, the, in the belief that these allegations had a credible basis that, that you were concerned about? Was that solely based on your own analysis, thoughts, inquiries, or were others involved in looking into it? No, I, I, think, I think it's one of the exhibits. There, there are a number of statements from people who um, had been victims of, of physical harassment, um, including uh, the drivers uh, for this prostitution service. Um, Deutsche Welle didn't deny it. Um, we were very surprised by it all. And uh, I had no part in it except to listen to the uh, uh, decision of the committee and accept it. Um, who was in the committee you're referring to? Who consist, consisted of it? Uh, Bill Kwam, Tom Gray, um, and there was a third person who, who I can't remember. So two Americans and a, and a Rwandan citizen, but I, I can't remember which, which one of our staff was in that position. Um, and do you recall that Mr. Hill at the time that he was asking you questions about the, the transfer of ass, the assets aspect of DVG's investment in the, uh, the acquisition of NRD's holding company, uh, that he also then went on to talk about Mr. Eller saying, uh, what he said in his witness statement that those, those things didn't happen, that equipment wasn't there. Do you recall those questions and the statement he directed you to? I do. Can I ask that the FTI bring up C-125? Mr. Eller has kind of fancied himself. Mr. Ms. Marshall, please, just, just. Okay, please. Take a look at C-125 when you get a chance to, when it comes up. Mr. Hill didn't question you about this document. I just want to ask you what it is and how it relates to this, this line is, of question, if, if at all. This, this is some of the equipment that came over, uh, that we brought over in a container uh, for specific purposes. It's a list of equipment that was in the container. Okay, now just first of all, who's the we? I'm sorry, Bayview Group. Um, it's, it's what type of equipment? Uh, we had needs of very specific pieces um, uh, as we were starting to build out. We had equipment there on the ground that we, many things you can buy locally. Uh, we needed these specific pieces of equipment out of our inventory uh, to take the next steps in, in building out uh, the artisan support um, practices uh, for Bayview Group. So when you say that they were brought over in a container, brought over from where? This container came from Slovakia. We, we had equipment in, in Europe and in the United States already to come. And this was, and, was part of that. And the reason it was in those locations, although purchased by BVG, is, is what? Well, the, because it's a matter of convenience. We, I have a house in, in Bratislava and I have a house in, in the United States and where, where I was and found convenient um, uh, assets, I or others in our group, uh, they, the, the storage tended to be either there or in, in the United States. We had more than one where was it? in the United States. And where was it purchased originally? 
this would, would have been either in the United States or in, in uh, Europe. And at some point it was brought to the, this equipment was all brought to the place where it was shipped from, correct? It was all brought to the place, for, to the you, shipping you point. It, yeah. Yeah. So, so it was brought together. So right. whose invoice is this? Uh, this is the shipping company. Um, you, you hire a shipping company, um, and and he, I think in this case it was our container. Uh, we delivered the the shipping, or the shipping company comes and pick it, picks it up from our compound, um, and then and then we pick it. Or we it appears at customs some months later. I don't know all the shipping uh, steps that go involved in getting it by boat. Uh, and then transport to Kigali. But we next see it in the cu customs compound in Kigali. Okay, and and I, I know it's probably uh, something that's assumed, but I just wanna make sure it's clear and on the record. So it's, it's an invoice from the shipping company and who is the invoice to? Who's expected to pay it? Uh, but no, Babe, you would have paid it. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't even see the shipping company name here, so I'm not sure. We, we use we use the local freight it's a freight forwarding company we used uh, this one is in Slovakia in Bratislava um, so we would have paid them for the shipping if that's what you mean I'm gonna ask you to, uh, uh, I'm all set with um, c125 um, ask you to focus on the, the discussions that came up briefly, although numerous times in brief fashion, it was mentioned that um, you, after, after the NRD uh, transaction, which it was established and acknowledged that at the time of the NRD transaction, an application had already been submitted uh, right. by the, previous owner and management of NRD, so before your time, an application to extend NRD's licenses had already been submitted. In then following your acquisition, it was mentioned a number of times, you had discussions with Mr. Bodega. Who is Mr. Bodega? Um, we were frequently in, um, in meetings with NRD throughout the period. So we knew about the application. We knew about Mr. Seanher's work on it. Um, it was not, uh, we helped to the extent we could on a number of issues. Um, so we were very deep, familiar with it in detail. Um, and I would say by um, perhaps March, Mr. Bodega, who was well known in the community as the head of the licensing and, and uh, uh, supervision department, uh, contacted us uh, to begin the negotiations for the long term licenses. Okay. Who is Mr. Bodega? Mr. Bodega is the head of the licensing and supervision department at, at the Rwanda government's o uh, office of, of uh, mines. The, um, the entire time? Yes. Okay. Uh, and he's the, he's the head of the committee which reviews licenses uh, for extension. Okay. The, it, it, does that committee, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I, the acronym I associate, I think in my head, is OMGR. Is that familiar? Is that right? No, or do I have it wrong? That's the overall department. The committee is within that department. Okay. So, are you just, you said he's the head of OMGR, is that what you said? The, 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 Dr. Michael is the head of it, he is the acting head of it. So if Dr. Michael was sick, um, uh, Mr. Bodega would be the head of it, yes. And, and, if, and if Mr. Michael wasn't sick, what was your understanding of Mr. Bodega's position at that, in, in those circumstances? Then, then he was the director of the Office of Mining um, regulation, uh, licensing, and supervision, and, and simultaneously the head of that committee, which made uh, reviews of, of license applications. 
and, and just generally, not trying to ask for a lot of specifics, but just generally, in, the, in your experience dealing with this office uh, and OMGR generally, after acquiring NRD, how often was Dr. Michael uh, available and fulfilling the role of the director? And how often did you interact with Mr. Bodega being his replacement, temporary replacement in that position? Uh, Dr. Michael was um, sometimes sick. I wouldn't say sick every week, but often sick. So um, Mr. Bodega was often in the position. Um, I, I had already, um, Anthony Ellers um, told me that he and Dr. Michael had worked out a, um, an arrangement where they were going to be able to um, uh, buy par a portion of NRD. Um, and so I was on bad terms with him. Just, just sticking with your experience in terms of Mr. Bodega and the, the, the shifting role from an assistant by being only a, a head of a committee as opposed to the head of the entire OMGR and when he was acting as that. Uh, in your experience, how often was Mr. Bodega in the acting director role of OMGR? Frequently. I could ask that C207 be brought up. Do you remember discussions, uh, excuse me, do you remember questions from Mr. Hill about a, a couple of the emails in this long document, um, this long chain of emails, um, and the discussions in those specific emails? Do you, do you recall that testimony? I, I recall the discussion. You, yeah. Okay. Um, if you could, um, so so, Je do you recall this document? Let me ask it that way. I, I only have the heading here, but I I, I do recall uh, that there was a document between Mr. Kevalinka and Dominic Bodega. Yes. It's a long document. I'm just going to do this to try to make sure you're oriented and you feel comfortable. You, you know what you're talking about as a is being on the table. So if I could ask FTI, just scroll down a few pages. Mr. Marshall, please indicate when you have a sense, you know what document this is, and this is a claimant's document, it's come from our production. So I'm, I'm hoping you can say you feel comfortable that you recognize this whole document after a few pages or so. Uh, yeah, it's obviously out of order. The third page should have been the first page. And if this... I could ask FBI to keep, keep 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 scrolling because it's it's more than one document, and I want to make sure you're just aware what we're what we're talking about. Do you recall producing an entire string of connected emails in a chain and their attachments? Do you yes. Recall doing that. Yes. Do you recognize this as the printout of an entire string of emails with attachments? Yes. yes. Okay. And the, the principal communications in this email chain, who are they between, you and who? Myself and Mr. Bodega and whoever else he had on his staff that was participating in this. Okay. Um, these are specific emails um, with their attachments in this whole production. Um, did you have any other communications with Mr. Bodega on the same topic, which is a license uh, a, a agreement, a contract? Um, did you have any we had discussions frequent. that are out, outside this email chain that are in addition to it? We, we had frequent discussions that led to this, uh, this document. So if I could ask FTI to, to to go to page 90 of the PDF. And if I've done that right, I'm sorry, let me catch up because I have to see it. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, Mr. 
Mr. Marshall, um, directing you, so one of the emails in the chain as they as they uh, exist um, is this December 13, 2011 email um, from Mr. Kibalanka to Dominique Bodega and to you. Do you see that? Yes. The one that's on the screen is from. Oh, the I, 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 it's entirely possible that I wrote down the wrong page number. I, I, I'm trying to speed this up, not slow it down. So rather than fumble around, let me make sure I get the. My apologies, just, just general um, mistake uh, on my part. I asked FTI to turn to one page and I didn't turn to it myself. So, um, so on page 90, it should be an email that starts from Mr. Bodega to you and copies someone else. Do you see that? Yes, that's his assistant that is copying. Well, uh, uh, that's what I wanted. To, I wanted to walk through it um, slowly because I, I, first thing I want to ask you is, do you recall that when Mr. Hill asked you questions about a, a specific email in the chain, he made the comment about your communication being with Mr. Bodega's personal Yahoo email account. Do you see that? Yes. Do you recall that, excuse me? Yes, it was, yes, regularly. Okay. And who is the, uh, the and um, I, I will do a terrible job, so I'll ask you, and hopefully you, you'll do better. Clement, who Clement, is the CC? Clement is his first name. It's Clement? Clement. Okay. But, yeah, but, um, but Clement. And who did you understand Clement to be at the time of this communication? That's his assistant. He also works at the ministry. Okay. So Mr. Bodega's email was to not only you, but someone else in his own minute in his own department. Yes. And, and uh, both to the personal email accounts. Yes. I, I don't think they had a, a, uh, entity email account system at that time. Um, you, you, before I go on with the specific questions just about pieces of this, I wanted to uh, tie up a couple of points where they were left off last time, but for the big picture, and if we need to talk about details, just tell me, and I'll try to direct just, just to those details that are important, but You've, you've mentioned recalling this long set of uh, strung together emails in attachments. You, you've said that in addition to it, you had other discussions. Now, just talking about all of the communications with Mr. Bodega and others in his office on the topic of licenses, um, uh, to, uh, uh, contracts for licenses, excuse me, in this time period. Um, can you describe the process as you understood it, that that was that the two of you were following in these discussions and compare in relationship to what I started by asking earlier today about the the typical process that that you described, the process that you said you went through in Cicero. How does this compare? The big picture, the process you were following. Um, we understood that this was the only process. Um, and, and in fact, I'm, I'm certain at this time, it was the only process where you sat down with, with Mr. Bodega and um, perhaps other members of that committee, um, and you worked through what the ministry's expectations were. The ministry um, uh, has good information about their deposits. Um, there are no unexplored areas of Rwanda that I'm aware of. Um, they know what their internal expect, they, they establish internally what they 
would like to see in terms of production and investment. And um, they say, look, if you want this uh, contract, uh, these are the terms that you will have to ex ex accept. And, and by and large, they're, they, I was told by our engineers, they are reasonable. Now, if I starting on page ninety one is an attachment to the email, so this is this is a another document that was communicated by the email, but this document itself starts on ninety one. Just want to orient you to the to what it was. It was a draft of it was the draft that was referred to in in the email. Yes. Do you, do you see that? Yes. Okay. So, uh, if I could ask FDI to go down to ninety three. So we're now at section 3B of this draft. And do you, uh, do you see the language under paragraph four uh, with regard to uh, this, the entire section uh, or subsection being the ministry's obligations? There's this par unnumbered paragraph under paragraph four. You could just look at that. Yes. Do you recall being asked some questions about that by Mr. Hill? I don't recall this discussion with Mr. Hill, no. You don't recall the, the talking about the time period? No. Okay, so Mr. Mr. Hill asked you to, in, in some emails, to talk about a time period that was referenced, and there was a, a reference to five years. No, no. And, right. then, and then you mentioned that there was other drafts with other periods. Right. Um, so following those, those questions out, so now we see a reference to something other than just saying five years, we see this language, that what happens um, at, you know, at the end, um, uh, um, yes, yes, I, I do remember the language. And it goes on in the, one, the, the, thir the third line of that unnumbered paragraph to talk about uh, NRD shall then be granted long-term 30-year concessions. Yes. Now, when in the discussions, when did that language and that concept get added? Uh, it was in the course of, of I, I, you mean which draft? I don't know which draft, it, where, when it was added. I'm not asking you to be that specific, just in the course, in describing your, 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 the process. This was specific where in the process. I'm sorry, I spoke over you. Go ahead. Sorry, no, this was specifically discussed with Dominic. This okay. was the expected. Now, now, that's what I want to focus on. What was discussed about adding this language and you know what to do with it in this in the drafts that went back and forth? They, they, they there was no un, unlike the questions from uh, Mr. Hill. There was no uh, reservation and no hesitancy about granting a 30-year license under the terms of this agreement. And, and this was to spell out how that 30-year license, um, uh, the terms of that 30-year license. This was to say that this was a five-year license was not true. That was not the expectation of either party. And um, after you know, it made its way into the, the, to the draft, did you talk about that with Mr. Bodega? What his view was about the language? It was consistent with the, with the statute. Um, he thought we, we, we had satisfied all the conditions. So this was not unusual. Based on anything Mr. Bodega set, said to you in the course of these discussions, once this language was in, did you consider this language to be contentious or tentative in any way? No, no. Not in the least. Okay, if we could scroll back up to, to uh, well, at, at starting at 90, again, doing it twice. Um, the, your email on December 13, um, before you sign off, please let me know what is your view on these. Um, you see that? 
That's, That's how right. you leave off that email. Thanks, Rod. <laughs> right above it. Right before oh, you sign off, you say yes. you ask you ask him what his views are, right? Right. And his immediate response was, "I'm missing the attachment." Um, if you go to scroll up FTI to page eighty nine. No, he, he agreed. Mr. Mr. Marshall, just please, okay. uh, I'll take you there quickly. Okay. I, 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 it would be helpful if we um, focus yeah, now on is. this e email. So I'm not asking for any and all things he said, but just after his immediate response saying, I'm missing the attachment, we have another, uh, uh, another response in the chain um, uh, on, from Mr. Bodega. Uh, that says, for me, it's fine, but I add some clarifications and corrections. Do you see that? that uh, I, I alert you, this is from 10 in the morning, and my response was at 120. Is that what, so mine is after that. Correct. And I, I, and I don't know the timing, like what time zone applies to which. I'm just saying, do you see that there's two copies of the e the same email, um, but different responses because there were different replies. The first reply said, I'm missing the attachment. The second one says, for me, it's fine. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, so I'm just drawing your attention to that. I'm just simply asking a, a, just a different question, not the timing of it and anything else. As a result of this response, were you comfortable that Mr. Bodega actually saw that draft? There's no question. And from any further discussions after that date, did you believe that that language was somehow in dispute or in contention between no. you and anybody else in Mr. Bodega's department or OMGR generally? No, certainly not. This was not a new concept. Okay, I, I also want to stick at, at a point, and I apologize for sticking at one point a couple of, of times, but I'll try to do this very quickly. If we could go to R201. Do you remember questions from Mr. Hill on this document? And yes. I'm not going to get into the substance of the act. You, you talked about it. Uh, Mr. Hill said the, the accusations you made were very serious and you had to pull back and forth on the substance. I just want to I just want to make sure you know what, you're, what email you're talking about, but not go back into the substance. Yes. Okay. Drawing your attention. So who is this email exchange with? Again, this reorient the tribunal. Well, I I don't recognize the, 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 the name at the top. I think that's an, an unusual version. Uh, Busingi Johnston is the Minister of Justice. So this was an email exchange with the Minister of Justice. And, and you got back from the email that, that you had to the Minister of Justice, you got back someone from his side, his department or that was working with him, this response, correct? Correct. And that person working with the Minister of Justice used a personal email account at Yahoo, correct? Correct. Um, after receiving this, did you ever receive any communication that led you to believe that this was somehow improper for this person to be sending you a communication on this issue of uh, official business using a Yahoo account? No, it was common practice at all times. Um, referring back um, to, uh, if I could reorient your memory, 
the questions that on the last document, the email exchange, the emails with Mr. Bodega, Mr. Hill was questioning you more broadly about the representations that you had made that uh, the your understanding, the uh, uh, license, the draft license was ultimately agreed on and actually submitted to cabinet and he challenged you on that. And he said at one point that you knew you could not get Dr. Mike's approval, which would be necessary for that to happen. And in your answer, you said that Dr. Mike was a wild card because he was angry at you. Do you recall that? Yes. Please explain why, as far as you understood, was Dr. Michael mad at you such that you considered him a wild card in any response? Uh, it was what I was alluding to earlier. Um, Anthony Ellers claimed to me that he had a private uh, business arrangement with um, uh, Dr. Mike and that they together would be sharing ownership in NRD through some machination. I was not aware of how this was, uh, he thought that this was going to come about. When I returned to uh, Rwanda after acquiring, with our group acquiring NRD, we had a meeting um, with uh, the, the tagging authorities, the ITA and others. Um, several hundred people are there. And it's, I think, the only time in my memory in Rwanda, uh, Dr. Michael was in a shouting match claiming that I was not the owner of NRD, that Anthony Ellers was the owner of NRD couldn't understand it. And um, uh, the minister, who was quite shocked because it's very unusual to have a, any shouting in Rwanda at all, took us to and please, you, please say specifically the min minister who? Um, the, the, the then minister of mines, um, his name was Bazi Bamo, uh, before Kamanzi came into the office. Uh, Ms., Mr. Bazi Bamo took Dr. Michael and myself uh, to a separate room away from this group of 300 people um, so that he could understand what Dr. Michael was talking about. Um, Dr. Michael was talking erratically and it was not understandable how Anthony Eller was, was expected to be uh, the owner of NRD. Uh, although uh, Anthony Ellers uh, later submitted his own application for our, our minds. When did that, would you call it, shouting match uh, occur? When, when was that event? March 2011. The first, the first ITA meeting. When, uh, when in time did Mr. Ellers tell you what he and Dr. Mike's expectations were for themselves regarding the NRD concessions? When we were threatening, uh, when, when, when he was under investigation for being fired. He was, he's a very um, aggressive fellow and he wanted to uh, uh, intimidate me. In, in the time period, that, that was- That would when? have been March, March, 2011. The first week of March, I think we fired him on the 8th of March. Um, and he submitted an application for our concessions also on the 8th of March, 2011, using our documentation. If I could ask FTI to bring up C35. Uh, do you recall? questioning from Mr. Hill about um, this application, um, which is uh, dated, if you, if you scroll down, I'm not sure if it's on the cover or where. November, 2010. Okay, so the, this is the November, 2010 application um, uh, made by NRD for continuation of its concessions, correct? For the long, term license agreement itself. I understand, I understand there was a lot of back and forth about that specific topic. Yep. Um, I, I, I'm just trying to touch on certain topics from your testimony and yes. uh, 
clear up any loose ends. So I don't mean to suggest we're going to cover everything again. So just please focus for a moment. Um, if we could go to, to FTI, if you could, uh, to page nine and 10 and let Mr. Uh, Marshall see those pages. And do you recall Mr. Hill asking you questions about what the uh, um, what the content of both the uh, <coughs> progress on the business plan and progress on things like uh, environmental uh, 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 efforts to, uh, and uh, and uh, production industrialization? Do you recall him uh, asking you questions about the specific aspects of the application and uh, the conclusion that he asked you to agree with that they were inadequate to meet the actual obligations of NRD at that time period. Do you recall those questions? I, I recall the question generally, yeah. And, and in, at, uh, some of those questions referred specifically to NRD's obligation, uh, as it was asked in the question, to, uh, to invest $39 million that it projected or promised and didn't meet that promise as of that time period. Do you recall those, those yes. questions? Yes. If I, could ask, if I could ask FDI to go back to page eight. And under the achievements and research sec section on page eight. Yes. I could ask you to highlight that, to bring it up so Mr. Marshall could see that more clearly. I'm just asking about that section for right now. Um, so here in the NRD November 2010 proposal, it wrote, does refer back to the volume of investment in working capital um, that was proposed originally by um, Stark's predecessor. You know, do, do you recall um, uh, Sorry, the, the reference to the 39.5 million as being the original proposed investment amount? Mm -hmm. Um, and, it, and it says here that uh, at the time of the November 10, 2010 application, that the original application, that, this, that the obligations pre that are precede, supposed to precede this, that 39.5 million actually covered five years, 2007 to 2011. Do you, do you see that, re that representation? Yes. Do you, do you recall what the original short-term concession time period was, how many years it was that NRD's original license covered? For four years. Starting when? Uh, it, it, I think for them it was 2006. Uh, so it finished, it, it would have finished the end of 2010. If we refer back to um, the, at that time Stark owned NRD's November 2010 application. What it's saying to uh, ultimately the ministry is the original time period that the commitment of $39.5 million covered went into 2011. What does that lead you to conclude about? Um, uh, NRD's original owners expectation of making that size commitment compared to obtaining a long-term concession? Uh, I, I think I've, I've said many times that this, these were um, effort to be able to show what they would be able to do over the period if they had the long-term concession. In so, other words, if, if they only had the original concession and then nothing further, would they even be investing anything in 2011 under their projections? I'm sorry, I missed it. Okay. Um, well, Mr. I, Mr. Caddy's had two attempts at leading this. I wonder if that might be enough. 
I'm inclined to agree. This is not this witness's document in the first place. He's simply being asked his opinion as to what it's saying. And uh, ultimately, that must be a matter for the tribunal. Uh, fair points. And I started by trying to remind people that's exactly what Mr. Hill asked him to do, is to draw opinions from representations that they did make in this document that there was essentially an acknowledgement that they failed to meet the, the, the uh, requirements of the, uh, uh, the, the contract and failed to meet the Zarnak's original representations. Since he was asked to opine on that, I'm trying to round out his opinion and, and ask what else he understood. If the, if the tribunal does not agree, I'll move on. But I, I did think I, uh, that Mr. Hill asked these very questions. He just wanted to focus on one topic, not the other. Well, I think the re-examination to focus on the questions asked by Mr. Hill. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, it's probably because I'm very tired. It, uh, um, are, are you suggesting I'm wrong? So I, that, I, that I'm not, I, I thought I was, and that's, I thought I was trying to do this fairly. But if, if you think I'm not, I'll just, uh, please no, I'm, I suggest we move on. The only, the only point I was trying to make about it- Mr. Marshall, Mr. Marshall, the tribunal did say that I shouldn't ask the question, so I, I don't the, think they want more of your answer, and I just would request you wait for me. Okay. I, respectfully, I, I'm quite certain this question was asked and was referred All to, right. so I'm just going to ask this, this ask next it, question. Ask it. <laughs> Mr. Marshall, sticking with that paragraph, if I could ask um, the next sentence, the original business plan included investment in the applied for mines of uh, Nakabingo and Gafurway. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, please tell the tribunal what those two references are what what are those 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 are two of the largest uh, long-term uh, sorry large-scale mining concessions uh, in very different parts of the country before and Nyakabingo are both tungsten mines one is being run by Rotongo Tinco the other is being run by uh, Chris Huber who's a big trader uh, and uh, they're very large operations as to your understanding of what NRD uh, had by way of concessions over its entire history, are you aware of NRD ever being awarded the concessions and the rights to Nakabingo or Gafurway? No, of course not. Okay. Did you have any ability in answering Mr. Hill's questions to apportion how much of the $39.5 million projected by the Zarnax in 2006 would have been spent on those two mines that were included in that uh, projection compared to the concessions that NRD did obtain. Uh, I never had a chance to address the issue. Um, it is an issue that was recognized by uh, the ministry. It came up from time to time and they knew that the 39 million was intended uh, an attempt to include Nakabingo and Gafurway build out. But, but that's why it never came up as an issue of contention until this uh, arbitration. Fair, fair enough, but just a little bit different question. Did you, in answering any of Mr. Hill's questions, did you have the ability to direct him to what portion of that $39.5 million applied to the actual concessions that NRD was moving forward with? No. There's a reference a little further up, the ore processing highlights to a FDI. If I could ask you to go up one section, one uh, ore processing highlight. There's a reference to a 20 ton processing plant at Cabrera in the Matsiro concession. 
You see right. that? Yes. Is there any other processing plant that you're aware of other than the one you testified about? Any other processing plant that you're aware of in the NRD concessions at any time other than the one you've testified to about how it worked, when it was working in answer to Mr. Hill's question? We had two uh, plants. One, at the one we've been talking about at Rosero, we had an upgrade plant that we constructed later in NEMBA. Okay, as to this processing plant, do you, do you see the reference to the root zero concession? Yes. Uh, do you recall questions from Mr. Hill about that processing plant? Yes. What it was capable of working on, how often it worked, yes. and that you answered questions about that? Yes. Okay. Um, this, in this application, re references uh, the intention to, to exploit primarily wolframite deposits with that processing plant at that concession. Um, uh, ultimately, you, when you, after taking over management of NRD, did you become familiar with what that processing plant was capable of doing? Yes. To operate that processing plant uh, for other minerals, what would be required? <laughs> it's art more than it is science. Um, all, all processing plants will work on the same principle. There is no such thing as a wolframite plant as opposed to a tantalum plant, as opposed to a cassiterite plant. It's all about crushing rock to separate the mineral from the host material. So what would be necessary for NRD to uh, operate that processing plant for other minerals than wolframite? Maybe no adjustment is necessary. It all depends on the type of host material. So if it's quartz, it may take more crushing. If it's, if it's uh, pegmatite, it may take less crushing. It depends on the host material around the ore. It, it, often it's described as, as extracting chocolate chips from petrified chocolate chip ice cream. And the principles are the same on all, all minerals. And when you're in your answer, when you're saying it may take more or less crushing, is that something that can be controlled by NRD's uh, operations team? Yes. But they change. Of course. The, you, in answer to a number of the questions about this processing plant, you, uh, you um, explained to Mr. Hill that the processing plant works not only from top to bottom, but in pieces. Can you explain particularly what does that mean that sections of it can be operated and other sections don't have to be operated at the same time? A processing plant is really nothing more than what miners do by hand. Um, you, you, you find uh, mineralized um, ore, uh, you crush it virtually to dust, and then you pan it like a gold panning. And, and the processing plant is nothing more than an automated, in, in a sense, uh, gravitationally fed um, series of steps, but all of the equipment is used separately or it can be used in a plant as part of an orchestrated and organized um, uh, series of steps. So for example, um, in the Root Zero plant, our, our local artisan uh, uh, teams would use portions of the plant, um, although uh, less frequently to use the whole plant. For example, there are shaking tables where you uh, lay out the crushed ore uh, in order to be able to get as many of the fines as you possibly can. And that process is actually better than trying to pick it out by, by your fingers. Same thing with the crushing end of it. You can crush material and then and then process it by hand in another location, depending on what you needed it for. This is not magic. SCF, I could ask you to bring up C62. Mr. Marshall, just please take a look at this. I'm gonna ask you if you remember being asked questions about this document by Mr. Hill.
Yes, I do remember. And in your answers, as I have it, uh, by no means complete, but the way you ended your answers, you said you weren't sure what certain things meant in the letter. And you asked Mr. Hill whether you could explain what you would do to find out what they meant. And the answer was no, and he moved on to another series. But I ask you now, what would you have done to find out what this letter really meant? Well, uh, again, I, I, I'm so, sorry if I sound repetitious, but nothing is done uh, in the abstract where a letter is sent and uh, uh, then the issue is resolved. It's a constant matter of conversation. We're talking really in the industry, there are six or seven perhaps large mining companies. Everybody is talking constantly to the ministry. Um, and that's why I was so uh, unhappy when we got cut off from those communications. So with regard to this letter in 2011, the first thing we would have done is gone over to the ministry and sat down with them and asked what is meant. If I could ask FTI to bring up C41. Now, do you, uh, if I could ask, well, this is a six page letter. Um, if I could ask you to put up a couple pages at a time, just so Mr. Marshall, first question again is just, can you reorient, do you recall in looking at this letter that you were asked questions by Mr. Hill about particular aspects of this letter Do remember the letter, and I remember the the uh, the conference, the meeting that was held, which led me to write this letter. And you recall that this letter also responded in some way, or was presented as being the next communication after a letter to you about certain things and needing environmental uh, act, action to uh, on environmental issues being one of them. Yes. And you recall that Mr. Hill, after taking you through this letter, said, despite receiving that request, you made no commitment whatsoever to take any action to address these environmental concerns. Do you recall that question? I recall the question. I could ask you to look at the last, if I could ask FTI to turn to the last paragraph of the letter. Above the word sincerely, this is a one sentence paragraph that reads, I would ask you to consider the points in this letter and to collaborate with us to resolve these issues. What did you mean when you wrote that sentence? Um, at this meeting and in his subsequent letter to us, he was insisting that we had, and I, off the top of my head without going into the language of the letter, we had been given an unreasonable time, like please solve all these environmental problems within X period, like one month or whatever it was, or your license are all terminated. And it was, it was, it was uh, unlike anything that we had seen. This was 75 years of, of Belgian fire hose sluice uh, mining, brown sluice mining. Um, we, would, we were happy and had already contributed um, lagoons and dams and, and constructions to be able to alleviate the silt that was coming down at this, the very beginning of the Surveyor River uh, stream. So uh, we wanted to help, but, but we could not do everything within 30 days or we lose our licenses. It was, it was to me, a, a very outrageous um, insistence that somehow, and we were being blamed for what the Belgians had done. So it, it, it was just all terribly unfair to me at the time. I'm gonna get back to the meeting and, and I'm gonna ask you a specific question about what happened. I know you've explained in your prior answers what your concerns were. And I don't want to suggest that you now need to say everything 
about the entire topic again. You don't. Okay. There were certain loose ends after talking about things, and I'd love to just focus on those. Okay. So that concern, which was expressed in writing, came out in a meeting, which we'll get back to. And uh, now there's a letter following the meeting that addresses the environmental concerns you just uh, addressed um, and other issues. But the letter ends, I would like to ask you to consider the points in this letter and collaborate and to collaborate, excuse me, with us to resolve these issues. What were you intending to say in that sentence? What were you offering to do? Well, they knew uh, based on what had happened at that meeting that we had already contacted uh, actually a, a, a world leading uh, environmental uh, a professional to come over and and look at it uh, from Olomouc University within less than I think a month after this letter they arrived um, to analyze what was had been done on the ground um, what needed to be done how to do remedial work um, so uh, we were willing to contribute we wanted to contribute but we didn't want to be accused of having committed the environmental sins that the Belgians had done and that we had a very short time to fix it. And did you get a response to the offer to collaborate no. on these issues? No. The meeting that, pre that we intervened, you've discussed how you felt, you discussed the, the fear again, and you, get, you discussed the, the reason for it, but can you, having already said those things, can you help uh, explain the context? What was it that was going on? What was the circumstance in the environment in which the things you've already testified about being said and your feelings as a result, um, you've already testified about that, but put it in context. Where was it? When did it happen? Um. You mean, you mean, what was the relationship with Mr. Kamanzi? No, I don't. You testified about the big picture issues and the, and, the, and the fear, but you said this particular meeting caused you great distress and you described that distress. Yes. Okay. What was the meeting? What, who was there? Why was there? What was happening? Mr. Mr. Kamanzi was new to the ministry. Um, he didn't know many things about mining or, or who, uh, was in charge and, or responsible for, for what processes, what was possible. This, this was a meeting of the miners uh, in this remote district. Um, uh, he used it as a, as a tool to give a political speech that he was gonna protect um, uh, his miners and it became uh, uh, an, an all out assault on us um, for, for what I could see was political reasons. Um, I, I asked to be able to speak and uh, he said, okay. And, and I stood up and um, he, he said, uh, but keep it short. And I said, okay, I want you to know I'm Rod Marshall. We represent NRD and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. And sat down. And that was really all that we were allowed to tell the community. Um, but we were being blamed by him for all of the environmental damage in that region. And it was very uh, uh, difficult environment to be in because I felt threatened by people who were very excited that we were, according to the government, according to the minister, were being accused of having caused environmental damage. Thank, thank you. And, and I just, just trying to get a, uh, a little bit finer, just context. You, you said it was a meeting of the miners said what was happened. I'm not asking you to repeat what happened or what was said. Why were you there? If it's a meeting of the miners and Mr. Kamanzi's there, why are you there? What was your understanding of what was supposed to be happening? And you've already described what did happen. Minister Kamanzi invited us to be there uh, to look at this site with him and, and to have a discussion about it. We, we, were, we were blindsided. We didn't know that this was coming. Now is the break time. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. President. I, I believe I'm at the at the break time. 
You are at the break time. We will break for 30 minutes. Okay, we're gonna open up the breakout rooms now. All right. I've got a large. It's not reacting. Well. It's not reacting. It's okay. It's just it doesn't. There we go. Yes, Mr. Carley, if you want to have Mr. Marshall back. Yes, this please. Is any... Okay. What? Bringing it's... back the witness. I apologize, we will absolutely figure this out. Um, no. Rod, you're on mute. Sorry? I, I'm telling the witness he's on mute. Oh, I see, right. <laughs> Rod, you are on mute. I don't have Thank control. You. Sorry. It's it's not within my control. <laughs> I, I know. Sometimes I just think yelling makes the difference. I don't. I'm sorry. Um, can, can, FBI, I, if I could, can I make one comment just so that the uh, record please, is... please answer. Please answer my questions. I, I'm going to ask. Um, I, I can do an awful lot for you separately um, and you and we'll address it separately. Um, but this is redirect and it's pointed. Um, I hope that's fair. Um, uh, FTI, if I could ask you to bring up R231. Uh, Mr. Marshall, do you recall uh, being asked questions by Mr. Hill about this August 3, 2012 letter to the RDB relating to the 2012 Benzingi um, incident uh, where he wound up being given control of the offices for a period of time, giving control of the concession. Do you recall being questioned and giving answers on this letter? Yes. You also testified at, in answer to those questions about being told by the registrar, registrar that the reason she made the change uh, at Mr. Benzingi's request because of threats she received from him. Do you recall those answers? Yes. Did you set, was this letter sent before or after the conversation with the registrar in which she told you about the threats? The threats I learned at the very end. So it would have been a week or 10 days later. So just to be specific, the letter in terms of when in time it was compared to being told about the threats, was the letter sent before or was the letter sent after you were told that information? The letter was sent before. If I could ask FBI I'll, I'll to bring up. My head, if, if I may read the the letter, I, I may be able to give more precise. Please do. I'm not trying to go so fast that it's, it, it feels like you're disoriented. I'm trying to help orient you, and you need to please tell me if I don't do a good job of that. I, I think the witness told us this in chief. I, I agree. Mr. Marshall, I think I don't have any further questions about the letter, so if you're comfortable, I, I'd like to move on to the next document. Okay, C48, please. I'm sorry, and I, I have to bring up the right document myself. So I can see the whole thing. One moment. So, Mr. Marshall, do you recall the uh, that the, Mr. Hill asked you questions and you gave some answers about this August 10, 2012 letter, again on the same 
topic that the prior letter covered. Could you scroll down? And please, uh, yeah, if you could, FTI, if you could scroll and let him see. Yes, please scroll down further. Yes. Okay, you, you, you recall the questions and answers? No, I don't. I, I remember the circumstances. I'm sorry, what was the question at the time? All right, no, I, I'm saying, do you remember already testifying about this letter? Uh, I remember talking about the, the, but I don't remember looking at this language, no. Okay, well, I'm gonna draw, direct your, uh, your attention to the end in any event. I've got one specific question okay. about one entry in the letter. The very last page, please, if you could bring that up. There's only a short uh, carryover paragraph there, or a new paragraph there. The yes. first sentence of the very last substantive paragraph says, it is clear to me and our investors that the RDB staff was completely misled by the threats and illegal actions of this man, Ben Benzingi. What did you intend to refer to when you wrote about threats? That Ben Benzingi had threatened uh, the staff at the RDB so, so that they would change uh, the commercial registry. I could ask now that C54. Sorry, just for clarification, we learned different aspects of the threats as the process went along. Uh, you have to speak to um, Ms. Karayonga, uh, who is the registrar, who can give you details about what he threatened and when. And, and I just want to make sure you, you're comfortable that you understand all we're asking, all I'm asking here right now. Have you already testified in response to Mr. Hill's questions about the, all of the threats you learned about? Have you, have you provided those, that information in your answers to Mr. Hill? I believe I have. I, I, and, I don't know. I don't know that, that he he was questioning how how it's possible that. Uh, this, as I recall the question he was asking, how, how would I know that Mrs. Karanga was uh, threatened? And, and there was a lot of discussion back and forth about why it had taken place. Uh, I, I was trying to put the onus on um, Mr. Benzingi here uh, and, and not uh, try to blame the staff of, of the RDB for what had happened. Uh, but it was, it was both, both parties were at fault because she didn't handle the threat properly. If I could ask that C54 be brought up. This is the January 13, 2000. January 30, 2013 letter um, with uh, su submitting documentation that's in the, in the reline reference as application for long-term mining license. Do you recall being asked a number of questions about this, uh, this application, the January 30, 2013 application? I, I don't remember what the questions were, no. But you do recall that questions were asked of you about it, correct? Yes. Okay. So um, prior to this sending this, um, let, me, let me say, it, uh, I'm sorry, let me strike it the way I started and re-ask the question so it'll come out sounding more intelligent. Um, what led to your submitting this January 30, 2013 uh, application for long-term license? They had asked us for it. They is who? The, the Ministry of Natural Resources had asked us for this additional document. 
Okay. And were there discussions when you say they asked you for it, were there discussions that they tell you what they were asking you to do? Sure. Yes. What do you recall being asked to do that led you to submit this? Uh, the, the process has a political dynamic. We didn't understand everything uh, that was going on or why the process had changed. We had been through, as you know, one exercise of negotiating the language of long-term license. Uh, this was, uh, we were grateful to have uh, not just be uh, told to go home, but a second chance to negotiate whatever it was. Uh, we don't, we didn't know why that we were being asked uh, to begin the process again. I'm going to ask you to. Uh, I'm going to ask FTI if you could leave that that up and just also bring up um, the uh, document C160. That's a January 21, 2013 Ministry of Natural Resources internal document. Was the substance of 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 that? internal request that negotiations start again, was that communicated to you at any time before January 30, 2013? I, I never knew, I never saw or knew the information that's in this January 22nd letter. This, is, this was new. Were you first asked for the submission that was uh, made on January 30, 2013, on or after January 22, 2013? Ordinarily, we, we, we respond within a week. Um, there's no reason for us to have delayed it. So I, I don't know what the connection would have been. All we were being told, as you can see in my letter here, is uh, please provide us with the draft long-term agreement that you've been working on. So we included a draft. We were glad to have the negotiation. I understood. I, I, I apologize. I've asked the confusing question because I... And, and we could take down C-160, it, 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 having said that you don't recall having it communicated to you, I'm not trying to orient you to the substance. I'm trying to orient you to date. So you said you had uh, discussions about what the ministry asked you to do. Was that request made on or after January 22, 2013? That's all I'm asking. Uh -oh. We, this is in response to some conversation we were having. We've been given instruction by the ministry. What the period was, uh, we, we never are more than seven days. Um, uh, we all respond to all communications within seven days as a matter of internal corporate policy. Um, thank you, Mr. Marshall. Is that what I you're asking? I, I'm, sorry, I, I'm not sure I understood the question. I was just asking for the time period between the request and the submission. I believe you answered it. I'm all set. I wasn't asking a follow-up question. Yeah, okay. Let me add one thing, though. Uh, depending on what it was, it, it, the <laughs> nature of the conversation with the ministry would have determined that. So I, I can't be sure that depended on how much additional work would have had to go into it. Thank you. Nothing further. The whole thing flies. Yeah. Uh, I think I just found the uh, screen share. Right. Um, <clears throat> so we now reach the stage when we should be um, hearing from Mr. Biscus. Is that right? And are, are we in a position to do so? The last I, I, I was told he was in the waiting room. In the waiting well, room. Now, Mr. Excellent. Well, let us invite him to join us. Okay. And, and if the uh, tribunal uh, uh, permits and, and, uh, and understands, Mr. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go dark and uh, Mr. Harrison will be doing the questioning. Very well. All right. We're going to go ahead and bring him in and just to let uh, everyone know that 
the use of his phone to uh, in replacement of 360 camera is up on Microsoft Teams. So we are also viewing his room. So we're bringing him in right now. Thank you. All right, Mr. Biscus, if you could turn your camera on and unmute yourself, please. Ask her one housekeeping question. Uh, before, oh. before you bring him in, could we just address one housekeeping matter? Yes. Are we permit? Is Mr. Marshall now permitted to uh, attend as to an join. observer? <laughs> yes, he is. I'll, I'll let him know. Thank you. Or if FTI, if we could just ask if, if you could put him in um, uh, with, without um, uh, you know, off, you know, off camera, um, I will let him know he could go back to the room and it's already set up. Correct. He, he is off camera, so he should be all set to just observe. I'll, I'll let him know. All right. There's. Okay, um, Mr. Biscus, can you hear us? You are not connected to audio. Oh, there we go. Hold on. Looks like he's connecting. Mr. Biscus, can you uh, unmute yourself, please? Muted. Excellent. Okay. okay, excellent. All right, Mr. Uh, President, I will go ahead and go off camera. Thank you. This can be in French, is this one? Is this one in French? Uh, <coughs> welcome, Mr. Biscus. There is a declaration we ask each witness to make. I wonder if that can be put up so you can see it i can see it you can see it would you care to repeat it please i would do so i solemnly declare upon my honor and conscience that i shall speak the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth thank you thank you mr biscus could you please tell the tribute the tribunal, your name, where you work, and your title. Okay. My name is Kevin Baskus. Um, I'm the general manager at Rotonga Mines in Rwanda. Um, I specifically look after Rotonga Mines, but I also have a consulting input to our sister mine in Yakabingo. Mr. Biscus, do you recall that you submitted two witness statements in this matter on behalf of the claimants? Yes, I do. Have you had a chance to review those witness statements? I have. Is the information in those witness statements true and accurate? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, that is correct. Uh, could you please tell us when TINCO first applied for a long-term license for the concessions that it operates? Um, for the Nyakabingo concession, although licenses were granted at the same time, the Nyakabingo concession, the application went in, I think it was September 2011, okay? The Rotonga went in in August uh, 2012. Okay, but we had, uh, we, we added some of the Nakabingo items as well in uh, 2012 with the submission, with the Rotongo submission, especially regarding the environmental side of things. And has Tinko subsequently received long-term licenses for those concessions? And if so, when did it receive those? Okay, 
we had knowledge of receipt in around about September 2014. However, I'm saying we had knowledge of the, uh, the license that had been signed. The granting order we received on the 29th of January 2015. So the official, as far as we were concerned on the mine, we received that on the 29th of January 2015. STI, if you could pull up um, Mr. Biscus's first witness statement at paragraph 11, which is on page five. You could just blow up paragraph 11. Thank you. Mr. Business, I just want to direct you to one line. Um, you write in 2012, Tinko had various investors that were very interested in investing in RML and ETI. However, no investor would invest unless RML and ETI had large scale mining licenses and security of tenure. Can you just very briefly explain why that is? Well, um, I, I think it's, it, it's pretty logical. If you do not own or have sufficient ownership in, in, in a, a building or a house or whatever, including a mine, you, you do not invest in something that you do not have sufficient ownership of. I mean, and, and that was our feeling at the time. Thank you, Mr. Biscuits. I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Hill. Yes, Mr. Hill. Uh, Mr. Piscus, so you joined Tinko in 2012 and served as general manager of Rutungo Mines with consulting Correct. responsibilities for Eurotrade, yes? Correct. Can we go to paragraph 19 of your uh, witness statement? Now, you meant you refer there to how some of the concessions previously held by NRD's investors are now held. Uh, were you aware that those companies, those concessions were in fact put out to public tender? I was not aware at the time. I, you know, at the time, um, I was under the impression that it was given to Ngali Mining. The reason being, at the time Ngali Mining was established, all mines that were not held by any company, the idea was that it goes to Hingali. I see, but you're not commenting then on the detail of the tender process and which companies were successful or not successful in the public tender? No, not at all. And do I understand from the previous comment you made that that understanding in paragraph 19 is no longer your understanding. Well, uh, to be quite honest, I do not know who holds the, uh, the, the license of that area. I do understand that at one stage, the mine was actually split up into smaller portions. Who owns what? I, I have no idea at the, at the moment. Thank you. I do not, sorry, if I could just add, I do not believe there's a large investor on that on that site at, at present. Otherwise I would have known that. Can we look at paragraph two of your witness statement? You say there you have detailed knowledge of the mining industry in Rwanda specifically and of natural resources development Rwanda and NRD's United States owners led by Roderick Marshall. And then you say, I've met with, shared, worked with, and shared resources with the owners and managers of NRD on many occasions. Now, who are you actually talking about when you talk about who you've been meeting with and working with? Is it just Mr. Marshall? And it's Mr. Marshall, Marshall and uh, uh, Susanna Mruskovikova as well. So those are the people you understand to be the United States owners and the managers of NRD? Absolutely. 
Now, uh, given that you joined in 2012, yes. you have no direct knowledge, do you, of the negotiations and discussions that led to the earlier contracts by RML, uh, for instance. You weren't involved in those negotiations. With, with whom? With the Rotonga? With, yes, say, with... take Rotonga and Rwanda. They, they had a contract that was entered into well before your time. So you don't know what was discussed yes. when, when that happened? Uh, well, I was not personally involved, but I do know subsequently when I joined, I had seen the contracts and um, I had many discussions with my CEO, who was actually part of the negotiations at the time. And in the case of the Rotongo contract, that was originally made of a previous entity, wasn't it, Umlaba? With Umslava, yes, that is correct. Yes. So again, you wouldn't be aware of those discussions? I was not part of the discussions, no. As I said, I'd obviously seen the contract after um, the discussions because, uh, you know, that was part of my, my job, yeah. And it was divulged to me through my CEO at the time. And you say you looked at the contracts. Each of RML, Protongo, and ETI, uh, Eurotrade, had their own rights under each of their contracts, didn't they? Uh, Eurotrade had... Um, the company started Eurotrade a year before Rotongo. Rotongo started in 2008, uh, Eurotrade 2007. So there was a year difference between the two mines. Yes. And it, but each company, each of those companies had their own rights under each, under each contract, yes? Absolutely, yes. And what those rights were depended on the terms of the contract. Exactly. Yes. yes. And the general understanding in the mining community would be that any entity party to a contract has the rights that are in, the, in that contract. Um, well, that's general understanding, sure. And you take each of these contracts would have had uh, obligations, and you may recall that they're under Article 2 of the contracts, that required each of Umlaba and ETI to do things. Well, that is true. That is true. Um, and, um, however, I, I just would like to make a, a statement here which we can expand on. The idea be behind a short-term license, a four-year license, is for the investor, the mining company, and it is included in there, to do the best of his, uh, the best of his ability to explore and to make sure that he has enough information to gain the level of confidence to ultimately make the long-term investment. That is the reason behind a four-year uh, exploration license. The onus is on the company to be able to garner enough information about the deposit in order to make the long-term commitment on a long-term investment. So the fact, yes, there were certain obligations. However, and, and we can expand on that, it depends from deposit to deposit, how you actually apply um, your money to be able to get the right information in order for you as a company to make a long-term investment. I, I don't know if that, if I make myself clear. But uh, as you say, there are obligations and the company can't expect the uh, government to provide a long-term contract if the company, for instance, is in breach of its obligations and hasn't complied of its obligations, correct? Again, again, I would come back to um, fairness in, in, in what these obligations are. As long as you've got a proper feasibility study based on the information that you have gathered 
to enable you as an investor. Um, nobody can actually dictate to you what you actually need to be able to get a feasibility study for your own use, because you're the investor, not the government. So I understand government wants certain commitments. However, at the end of the day, it's the investor that has to uh, ensure that for his being, not for the government, for him, the information that he's gathered is sufficient for him to make a long-term investment. If he cannot get enough information and the, the, the ore body uh, does not make sense for a long-term investment, he pulls out. So getting back, generally any company all over the world would do the minimum amount of work to get the best amount of information during the exploration phase. And it cannot be dictated to by any entity. And I know in these, in these contracts, there is, you have to do it this way. The question is, is that right and is that fair? Well, you say is that right and is that fair, but you've already accepted, and it's right, isn't it, that all, we, all your mining companies accept they're subject to the obligations in the contract, correct? They are subject to the obligations, yeah. And there are three things going on, aren't there? There are a set, firstly, there's a set of obligations in the contract that are the obligations. And if they're not satisfied, then you can't expect to get a long term license. That's the first point. Do you agree with that? Actually, I do not. If they're not satisfied to whose, if they're not satisfied, if, oh, let's put it this way, if the investor cannot have the confidence sufficient to make a, a commitment for a long term and he doesn't satisfy himself, um, then I understand it. However, if the investor finds that he's got enough information, he's the man with the money or he's the investor that is going to put money into this business, not the government. If he, as the investor, has sufficient confidence with the information that he's garnered, to make that long-term commitment, surely the onus is on the investor. Well, if you just That's think of how it works in all mining companies. If you just think of a hypothetical example, Mr. Biscus, yes. the government is not going to say to anyone, you just make your own decision without any parameters at all, without any policing of that. And as long as you're happy, then we are going to give you a 35 year license. There's always going to be parameters and targets you would need to hit, or the government would have to make the decision, correct? Certainly when it comes to environmental, it comes to certain standards, but the actual mining commitment, um, you know, again, I, I could expand. There are different types of deposits and there are different, the different types of deposits warrant different methods of exposure, of exploration. So it is difficult for the government to say, you at Rotonga, because you are a, a, a brownfields vein deposit, must spend X amount of money in opening that up. Whereas you, in some other greenfields deposit, you must spend so much. It, it, it makes life very tricky to do that. That's, not, think that's not the way it works, is it? Because under the contracts, that's take, how it should be working. Well, but take take Rotongo, for example. Yes. Under the contract, Rotongo yes. explained it, it, it came up with its own plan, including yes. its own investment plan. And so it wasn't a question of the government telling it what to do. When it entered into the contract, it had its own plan, but what it had to do was meet the plan, correct? How do you understand the, the old body when you start from scratch in the four-year period? We put together, and that's why I came to Rwanda, to put the long-term plan together in 2012, based on the information that we had gathered in the four-year period. We took that information and then put our long-term plan together and said, that is what we are committing ourselves to. It's very diffi difficult and it's actually impossible for anybody to walk onto a premise 
and say, I'm going to spend 14 million bucks on, on, on this, on my exploration. That is crazy. Nobody does that. But if you take Rotongo, for example, there was an obligation under Article 2 of the Rotongo contract to spend money in the four-year period, wasn't there? There was an obligation, that's true. And so, as I said... I'm earlier, questioning the fairness of it, that's all. But that, yes, I, I, I see your point. Can, can, can I just, uh, you know, could I just make a very simple analogy? You want to go and rent premises, a building premises. The person is prepared to rent that building to you. However, he says, before you, before I sign off, I want you to build a new office here. I want you to build a, a new uh, a, a warehouse or, or whatever. I want you to do all of this. Only then will I sign the agreement that you can rent it for long term. Uh, you know, nobody in his right mind would do that. That is the simple analogy by expecting a company to, to spend a lot of money in the first four years because you have no guarantee that you're going to have long-term ownership. That's in, the point I'm trying to get across. But in the case of Rotongo and in the case of other companies, even on your analysis of things, those were the obligations and that's what companies agreed to do, isn't it? Well, they are. Um, there are the obligations. Uh, was that done uh, scientifically? How were these obligations? Made? I don't know. I wasn't here at the time. Um, and, and, in the case, and in the case of both uh, Rotongo and ETI that had successful applications, the, co the yes. government was satisfied that the, with the company's applications, weren't they? I know you have a complaint that it took a long time, but as I understood your evidence earlier, you knew... I think you said by late 2014 that the government was satisfied with the applications. Well, it took us three years. In fact, we could only start doing something from January 2015. In those three years, or almost three years, um, this mine suffered horribly because, you know, we had known at the time in 2012 when we put the business plan together. We needed long-term capital. This mine is not sustainable. And if you would like, I can explain the reasons behind that. No, thank you, Mr. Biscus. I have no further questions. Okay. Mr. Biscus, could you please explain the reasons behind that as to why the mine suffered greatly? Excuse me, why, why the company suffered greatly? Okay. Let me get back to the, the four-year period. The four-year period gives you as the company the opportunity to determine if the ore body or the mine that, or, that you want to invest in is good enough for you to invest in. Okay. During the phase, and Rutongo was a brownfields operation. When I say brownfields, it was a mine that was started in 1930 by the Belgians. So the methodology that we had to employ to explore this mine was reopening a mine that had previously been mined by the Belgians. That means we had to clean out and hence we spent quite a bit of money because we had to buy equipment to get into 80 kilometers of tunneling underground. That was the extent. So that is why we had to bring in compressors, locomotives, all this equipment to be able to own this, uh, open this mine. When we did that, we found that, wow, we've got so much left that the Belgians left. We've only got maximum of two years to keep us going, after which we have to make substantial investment. And hence, we put in our long-term plan on that basis. We needed the money like in the end of 2012. In fact, I was told the licenses would be available after, you know, eight months after we put in the application. So three years caused us severe damage. 
And I know the government says, but all our applications were in order and all sorts of things. But that delay caused us material damage to this day. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Could I just ask a question, please? To what do you attribute the delay in getting your concession? To what do I attribute? You know, I, I, I'd, I'd hate to speculate. I know the government says that there were certain issues with ownership because Rotongo at the time was 90% owned by the government, 10% by the Tinko group. And, and hence, you know, you cannot make an investment if you only own 10% of, of a company. They're saying that it was because of this, uh, the relationship between government and Tinco and sorting out the shareholding agreement. Now the shareholding agreement has only been finalized in January, 2021, incidentally. However, I believe there was something else behind it. What it was, I do not know. But I don't believe it was the shareholder sorting out the shareholders' agreement. Um, it, it's uh, you know it's it's difficult to to speculate at at this stage. But it, it it just didn't make sense that it was just because of the the delays in the shareholders' agreement. Thank thank you. Mr. President, is the witness released? Yes. Okay. And Ms. Uh, Rus Ruskovakova, I'm so sorry how I mispronounced that. Um, is she in the waiting room or do we need to make contact? Very well. well it's uh, Ms. Mr. Mr. Callie, we we uh, uh, we're ready to log her in. I sent her an email asking if she was ready. I've not gotten a response, so I just need somebody to be able to reach out to her. But I'm ready to go to log her in. Just she needs to be in front of the computer. Thank you. That's what I was asking. We, uh, uh, I apologize to the tribunal. The the day when it became uncertain in timing, messages we were trying to go back and forth with the various witnesses. Um, we're obviously not uh, on on top of this enough that she's already sitting at the computer, but we're working right now. If, if now would be an appropriate time for, you know, uh, taking a few minutes. Um, well, Mr. We'll, Biscuit, we'll adjust the tribunal about- Am I done? Sorry. Office. Yes, Mr. Biscuit. I can leave. Sorry, Mr. Hill. Um, um, Mr. FTI, um, Mr. Biscuit is released. Sorry? I'm sorry, Mr. President. It yes. was just that Mr. Biscus hadn't realized that he was released, so he was still hanging on, and I was just trying to. Oh, to yes. No, Mr. Biscus, thank you very much. <laughs> we are making calls and uh, texts, um, and we will report in, in a moment exactly where uh, we stand in terms of uh, Ms. Muskovakova being in, in front of the computer. No, we don't want to. Not quite. Okay, we'll we'll um, retire, and, and uh, if we haven't got an answer in ten minutes, we'd like to come back, please. I'm sure, go ahead. Apologies, I'll open up the breakout rooms. Waiting for respondents. All right. Okay, Mr. President, the the witness is in the waiting room. I'll go off camera, and I'll wait to hear when to bring uh, her in. Well, I think we want to have her brought in straight away, please. Excellent. Yes, please.
Mr. President, the witness is seated and the declaration Thank is up. Thank you. Um, Ms. Mariskova, uh, you have a declaration in front of you. Yes. Uh, would you please uh, repeat it? Yes. Aloud. Uh, I solemnly declare upon my honor and conscience that I shall speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. May I proceed, Your Honor? Yes, please. Ms. Moskovkova, um, I'm going to apologize. That, that this will be the first time, um, and hopefully not uh, too often, but uh, for how I pronounce your last name. Please introduce yourself to the tribunal and instruct me on how to pronounce your last name better. Uh, my name is Zuzana Mrushkovichova. I apologize, I didn't get it right either. <laughs> no, 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 this is this Eastern European name, so it's okay. Um, I, I'm going to ask for an indulgence uh, for the uh, otherwise gross informality, uh, but may I call you Ms. Zuzana? Yes, please. Uh, Ms. Zuzana, uh, what relationship did you have to, what position did you have with NRD? Uh, I came to NRD in uh, 2011, and I actually went there for an audit to check what's happening there. And uh, then I became the finance admin manager controller of the company. And then I stayed till, I stayed in Rwanda till 2018. Do you, uh, do you have a relationship with BVG? Yes, I was also involved in BVG. At that time when BVG licensed CISA or you know, that BVG uh, contract was in place, I was not um, working much with the mining. I was really involved in the, in the charity program. So uh, I, was, I set up the charity organization and uh, that was, I did it in my, my free time, obviously, but I was involved in Rwanda through that charity program. Do you have a relationship with Spalina? Yes, I have. I have. I have in Spalina. Uh, I worked for for uh, Spalina. Was the owner of the the NRD in Rwanda, and I worked for for NRD in Rwanda. And uh, do you have a relationship? Did uh, at any? Did you have a relationship at any time with Tinko? I had the relationship with Tinko. I started to work for Tinko Group in uh, summer 2015. And at that time period, were you still working in your capacities with BVG and NRD? Yes, I was, I was, because we are still hoping that, uh, uh, or we had the, 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 the signs that we can get the concessions back. So it would not be smart to leave Rwanda and go home. And uh, it was a good decision because it was, I think, September 2015 when we got the office back. So there are still these good signs that something will happen. What was, when you started with Tinko, when you worked with them starting in 2015, what was your position? Um, actually, Tinko had a finance admin manager uh, who was defrauding some money and there were big issues and he was fired and they needed the quick replacement. So uh, because I lived in the same compound with the Tinko people or with the CEO of Tinko, then it was a natural fit somehow that they uh, asked me if I am willing to be interviewed by the management which came from, uh, from London. Uh, this was in summer 2015, they interviewed me and then they said that uh, if I'm interested, I can start to work for them. And then I started to work for them. To your understanding at that time, uh, were they aware of your relationship with NRD and BVG? Of course, I would say that everybody knew. There was no secret about it. Was, uh, was any concern ever expressed to you about your working both with NRD and uh, Tinko? Not at all. Why not? 
why, let me ask it this way. Are you concerned about holding, holding positions with both companies? No, 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 not at all. You know, I was waiting that uh, we will in the end either get the settlement with Rwanda or we'll get the licenses. So in that case, I would simply uh, quit my work for Tinko and I would continue with NRD. But uh, uh, I mean, at that time, I was just waiting for, for some decision to be done. So that's why for me, it was uh, a pleasure to, to work with them and do something for them. Uh, thank you, Ms. Zuzana. No, no, no further questions. Thank you. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill, you're on mute. I'm sorry, especially as I managed to pronounce the name right. Um, I'll, I'll try again. Ms. Rushkovichkova, could you go to paragraph six of your witness statement? Excuse me? Could you go to paragraph six of your witness statement? Yeah, I don't have any documents. Yes, you'll be shown it, don't worry. You should have a, hopefully you'll have a screen. That will... Not yet, not yet. Oh Is yeah, no, on a screen? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. You say there, prior to investing, Rwanda informed claimants they would become long-term concession holders if they signed the contract and invested in the Rwandan mining industry. Tinko was told the same. And you've just yes. dealt with the contracts in, in this part of your witness statement. You're dealing with the contracts of NRD, ETI, and RML. Now, uh, who are the claimants that you're referring to in that sentence? Claimants must be in this case, the claimant of this case, I guess. Well, it's your witness statement. What, who did you have in mind? Yeah, claimants, that's a defined term for this case. So you, you're saying you meant the claimants of this case, yes? Yeah. Who are they? NRD. So you think NRD is a claimant in this case? Yeah. And uh, are you suggesting that there, that NRD was told that uh, they would be, it would become a long-term concession holder if it signed the contract, yes? Yes, yes. And, and why do you say that? Because you weren't there, were you, when that contract was entered into? Yeah, but I read the 2008 law. So you think from reading the 2008 law that that means that Rwanda informed the claimants they had become long-term concession holders, do you? Yes, and it was the understanding of the Tinko Group too. Now, let's, uh, you also weren't around when any relevant contract of Tinko's was signed, were you? Because you began work with them in 2015, correct? Yes, correct. Now, let's look at paragraph seven and eight. Actually, no, I can skip that now. Um, I get to move on to a different topic. You weren't told at any point, were you, that there had been a long-term license submitted to Cabinet? We were told that, yeah, we were told that I was not part of the negotiations that was negotiated with, with Mr. Marshall, there were uh, Mr. Bidega and, uh, and some other people from GMD. And yeah, that was the, what, what I was told, correct. Uh, I'd suggest that's something that you have been told more recently by Mr. Marshall. Is that right? No, not recently. It was at that time. It was at that time, at the very beginning. Now, I'm going to change to a different topic. It's right, isn't it, that Rutungo, you deal with, you deal in your witness statement with uh, Rutungo and uh, whether or not it inherited its, all its infrastructure. But Rutungo didn't inherit all its infrastructure, did it? For example, it had to build a railway line, correct? Not really, not really. Uh, Rutonga was the Blackfield mine. It started in 30s and uh, Belgians built a lot of infrastructure there. So for example, the, uh, the headquarters, they had an upgrade plant, which was used all the time and it was used um, uh, by Rutongo, it was not uh, broken, it, but it was a Belgian technology and Belgian machine, so they were quite old. But while so, there was some, just, just to focus on my question, while of course Rutongo did inherit some infrastructure, it also had to do other work, didn't it? 
for instance, building a railway line, yes? Yes, but that's the business as usual. Like whatever you do, you always have to build something. If you extend your tunnels, then you have to extend your rail railway line. So uh, that's... Now, you refer at paragraph 16 of your witness okay. statement to a comparison between Rotongo's application for a long-term license and NRD's application for a long-term license. Could you be shown Mr. Imina's witness statement at paragraph 58? So Mr. Imina's witness statement at paragraph 58. Oh, you're doing it too quickly. I didn't finish even the previous one. Well, it was your witness statement. So uh, I'm, I don't, you don't need to spend time on that because I imagine you know it. Paragraph 58. Yes. You say, this is Mr. Imina's witness statement. You know who Mr. Imina is? Mr. Evod? Imena, I -M -E -E -E. Imena. Yeah, Imena. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. So this is his witness statement. I'm just going to see, show you what he says about Rotungo's application. He says, Rotungo's application, for example, was much more detailed than anything submitted by NRD. It contained a detailed feasibility study, which had been independently assessed. They were also able to demonstrate to our satisfaction that in the four-year initial period, when working on the basis of a short-term license, they had made significant investments of in excess of $20 million into exploration, infrastructure, and equipment, making significant strides towards industrial mining and away from artisanal mining. Between 2008, when it took over the concession on a four-year license, and 2012, it had increased tin production from an average of 23, oh, sorry, of 83 tons per year on average between 1995 and 2007 to 1,042 tons in 2011. The workforce had grown from 300 artisanal miners in 2006 to more than 3,000 in 2011. They had carried out high-quality exploration and provided comprehensive estimates of reserves and a detailed plan for exploitation. Expenditure on exploration alone between 2008 and 2012 was in the region of $4 million. The difference between what Rotungo submitted and had achieved and what NRD submitted was enormous. And then can I go to the next paragraph? He then says, further, Rotungo and Eurotrade's production levels were much higher than those of NRD. For example, as mentioned above, as at 2011, Rotungo, which had just one concession area, produced on average 1,042 tonnes of cassiterite per year and employed over 3,000 people. In the same year, NRD, over the five concession areas, was producing only 62 tonnes of cassiterite per year, which is only just over 5% of what Rotungo was producing. And you can't dispute any of those points from Mr. Emina, Emina can you? Oh, definitely. Uh... Mr. Uh, Evort is, uh, or Mr. Imena is um, comparing apples and oranges. Rutongo was the biggest, or is the biggest deposit in Rwanda. So that was, it was a very rich mine, even in the 30s. For example, there was a, I don't know, the cobblestone was uh, coming from the bottom of the hill up to the Rutongo. Uh, there was a hospital, which was better than the hospital in Kigali. They had a, a country club, pool, tennis court. That was very rich mine. So to compare our, uh, let's say, Nemba uh, concession compared to this, it's a completely different deposit. And remember that the deposits which were in the West, that was Greenfield operation, they just started. So that's only to compare these two things, completely different, different animals. To say about this production, uh, the production, which was that high, was only in few months in 2012. Why? Because when they started to clean up the, the, the tunnels, they found their pillars, which the Belgians left behind, like supporting pillars, and there was mineralization. So when they took these pillars out, they were able to do the tonnage. And, the, and when you see the progress of Rutongo mine right now, it's, it's from that number, it was going gradually down, and this spring, they ended up a half a container a month. So for Mr. Imena to say that this is a, oh my God, great, uh, I truly don't agree. You know, it, that, the facts are not showing that. Now you refer to a laboratory. Uh, it's, it's right, isn't it, that there wasn't a laboratory? 
that NRD had, correct? I don't know what is laboratory or oh, laboratory. Yeah, 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 yeah. We had the laboratory, uh, Rutongo, our Tinko group didn't have the laboratory, correct? NRD didn't have a laboratory either, did it? Uh, uh, NRD had a laboratory, very sophisticated. We had several XRF uh, machines. We had the desktop uh, lab machine, which had uh, like a printer in the end. We, have, we had a mill for preparation of the samples. It was big like a large refrigerator or a washing machine where, where the minerals were put in. Then they were milled into the powder. And that was the basis how the, how the samples were prepared for the XRF uh, uh, machines. So then we had the results of that. And we were using it on a daily basis. I mean, that was also used for the, for the uh, sampling program. So if, uh, okay, for the sampling program. Give me one moment. The right, the true position is uh, there was a portable water pump and a portable Niton XRF spectrometer, and that cons constituted your laboratory. Yes? No, that's not true at all. That's not true at all. Now, you make in your witness statement some very general allegations about uh, Bosco, Miss Bosco and Senge Yuma. You remember he, he, he was the bailiff, yes? Yeah, I think I will not forget him till, till, till the end of my life. And he was executing on a number of court judgments that had been given against NRD, wasn't he? This is what he said. We didn't see them, but this is what he said. Now, you suggested in your uh, evidence that he stole $800,000, and that's inaccurate, isn't it? I think it's much more. And, you also, and you've also suggested he didn't follow Rwandan procedure or rules, but the correct position, he was a professional bailiff who took care to follow the rules, yes? No, I would say that he was very unprofessional a bailiff who just decided to steal NRD's property. And what he was enforcing was a number of judgment debts from employees, correct? He probably. Yes, and if you go, for instance, take Mr. Bosco's witness statement at paragraph 26, Uh, no, sorry, it's uh, in Mr. Unsengi Yuma's witness statement. FDI here to Mr. Unsengi Yuma. You go to paragraph 26 of that document. Thank you. I appreciate the, the clarification. Yeah, paragraph 26. Thank you. He deals with part of a story involving you. He deals, he says on 23rd of June, 2014, Odette Yankiluli, head of the Access to Justice Department at Minijuice called me in for a meeting the following day. I attended this meeting on 24th of June, 2014 at the office of Minijuice. Ms. Marushkova, I'm sorry about that, and Mr. Benzingi were present as were uh, representatives from the US Embassy. Mr. Marshall accused me of harassing him and claimed there were no judgments against NRD. I explained this was not true. Following some discussion, it was agreed I'd give NRD copies of the judgments I was trying to enforce, that I would allow NRD representatives to enter the office for two days on 25th and 26th June so they could prepare a payment plan. We also agreed that NRD would provide me with their payment plan by no later than 8 o'clock on 27th of June 2014, and that once the payment plan was agreed, the office would be reopened so that NRD could continue working and raise money uh, to make payment in accordance with the payment plan. And that represents what happened in June to, in that part of June 2014, correct? No, that's not correct. For example, Mr. Benzinger was not at all there. Uh, he never visited. Uh, there were representatives from the US Embassy, that's correct. Uh, that uh, harassment, there were no judgments. Uh, that's not true. We knew that there are judgments but uh, not. But what was Mr. Senyuma doing 
he was showing only one judgment all the time. So he didn't show us something else. So based on this one piece of paper, he just continued seizing and seizing. You know, if let's say uh, what we calculated, so we were, we did owe to employees about $30,000. So then there is no explanation why he was, uh, he sees the, the bulldozer, trucks, uh, cars, pickups, all these things. So, you know, when you add all that together, he was actually stripping the company from assets. Well, he had judgment debts for more than $30,000, didn't he? He had what? Judgment debts for more than $30,000, didn't he? $30,000, but only the, the chairman car, which he sees, was for $30,000. No, no, he had judgment debts for more than $30,000, didn't he, that he was executing on? Not aware of that. What we are aware of is $30,000. And then uh, let's go to paragraph 27. On 25th of June 2014, I went to NRD's offices as had been agreed at the meeting on 24th of June 2014. Mr. Marshall, Ms. Mariskova and Mr. Benzingi were all present, as was Eugene, a bailiff working for Minijust. Mr. Marshall and Ms. Mariskova said they would not work with Mr. Benzingi. I told them that my only duty was to open the office as had been agreed and that if they did not want to work, want to work with Mr. Benzingi, that was a matter for them. Mr. Marshall and you then left. So I handed the keys to Mr. Benzingi and also left. I also gave Mr. Benzingi the keys to the Nember site. On 1st of August 2014, I prepared a statement about what had happened, which I sent to a number of people, including the Minister of Justice and the police. And that's accurate too, isn't it? That's not accurate at all, because Mr. Benzingi was not there at all. So Mr. Senyungwa couldn't give him the keys. He didn't give him the keys to the Nemba side because they just went to Nemba side and they took over without even informing us. So they suddenly, they took the office, then they took the Nemba, even not telling anybody anything. So that's no. definitely not true. No, it's, Mr. Benzinghi then goes on, sorry, Mr. N N N Mr. Bosco then goes on to deal with a temporary suspension of execution by the minister followed by its restoration, restoration after investigation. And he goes on at paragraph 33. Can we go to that? He's, you say, still NRD refused to pay what was owed under the judgments I was enforcing. As a result, I had a meet, as a result on 28th of October, 2014, we had a meeting convened by the regional police commander at which you and the police were present. This meeting, you told regional police commander that NRD would never pay the judgment debts. The police told her that if NRD did not pay, then I could continue to enforce. I recorded what had happened in a meeting in a note. And that's, again, accurate, isn't it? That's not accurate at all, because I was there with our lawyer uh, who told the, the, the police person there or the police commander that first Bosco should, pre, uh, should show us all the judgments uh, which he had. And second thing was, he has to tell us for how much he sold the assets and, and which judgments he satisfied. That was the condition. So then he could enforce, but we never got any information about anything. You were making allegations that certain of these debts were not due or had been paid and were not outstanding as judgment debts and he was asking for substantiation of that, and you declined to provide it, correct? We didn't have information, sir. Now, let's go, to, right. let's Sorry, go to the document you... at C149. Now, the background to this is that you were seeking to remove a magnetic separator and transport it to the Congo, yes? Not true at all. We were moving uh, the separator to Kigali and Bosco was, uh, he had to have informants or whatever. He followed us and he actually on the way, he took the, the uh, magnetic separator, jigs, crushers, whatever was there and he took it uh, and he seized it. It was parked, stored in Spedak, and uh, we tried to get it out, but the Spedak people said like, well, we have to figure out what to do with Bosco. So uh, 
actually he even didn't have the judgments for all these, these machines which he seized. The paper was only for the magnetic separator. So he was illegally storing there the other, other equipment. So then he says like, uh, oh, madam, let's go 50-50, win-win. So, I mean, I was, I was shocked. I mean, I'm going to get involved with this person who just cleared all the assets of NRD. I mean, how even dares to talk to me? Well, let's look at the third, the uh, second page of this exhibit. It says, for example, you pay 50% for your debt and I give you permission to take separator in Congo. So he clearly is understanding that you are trying to take the separator into Congo, isn't he? Correct? I don't, I don't know where he got this idea, but the, the fact is that he seized it, he put it there, and now he had a great idea that it will go to Congo. If he took it to Congo in the end, I don't know. But the separator never got back to us, and I have no idea what happened with all the equipment. You, you were seeking to remove it to Congo uh, because you were seeking to uh, take it to avoid execution on it. Correct? That's, that's, sorry, but it's nonsense. That's not true. And what he's proposing is a regular and acceptable deal, isn't it? Which is that he will allow this to be taken out of his execution on the basis that you pay 50%, do you see the words, for your debt? Yes? Look, from this SMS, it's even not clear what is the debt. Is it the debt for the storage in SPEDAC? What is the debt? He never calculated the debt. What is the debt? The, the judgments he fulfilled or he didn't fulfill. What is the debt? So you cannot react to that. I don't know what he was talking about. Well, uh, you know that he was seeking to execute against debts. And what he's proposing is a deal whereby he gets half the price of the separator to be set against their debts. Nothing improper in that, is there? Uh, it would not be uh, improper if he didn't seize all these uh, big machines already before. So when we never got any information, what he did with the seized uh, uh, machinery and all these properties which he seized, minerals, and you know we can have a long list of things what he seized, and he didn't prepare for us a clear description. I seized that, I got so much money, and I paid these people and these, these, these judgments. So then you can have with somebody a reasonable discussion, but to have this kind of virtual discussion and nobody knows what they are talking about, then it doesn't seem very reasonable to me. All the negotiations he was conducting with you were via uh, Seabag, weren't they? Because you, well, yeah. you had refused to deal with Mr. Unsengi Yuma, hadn't you? Sorry, I didn't understand. You had refused to deal with Mr. Unsengi Yuma, hadn't you? No, I just don't understand with whom I was dealing with. Yes, you had refused to communicate with Mr. With Mr. Bosco, hadn't you? Well, I would be delighted to talk to him if he came with the, with the, with the, the, some information for us. Which judgments, which people, how much, what happened to that? Let's talk. But he was refusing to do that. His he, job was to clear the company. That was his job. He was seeking to negotiate with you via Seabag, wasn't he? Oh, Sebag, you mean uh, Spedak? Oh, yes. okay. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Spedak was in a dead end. Spedak couldn't do anything. You know, Spedak people were my friends. They were the Germans who actually made all the imports for, for, for NRD. So they knew exactly what is happening. And they also knew what is Bosco doing, that he was just stripping the company from assets. So they also, yeah. Can you go now to bundle R203? This is a note of a meeting with Mr. Imina in September 2014, which you attended. <clears throat> and uh, can we look at page two, second page of this, and read the first five sentences. So this is September 2014. You say, next discuss point was issue of tags. NRD in its letter, as attached, asked the minister to provide tags for the NRD concessions. Minister said he will not approve to provide the tags if NRD doesn't, not, doesn't have license. NRD pointed out that from 2011 there is no license and NRD was allowed to mine and tag. 
uh, invitation for the negotiation of long-term license was sent from uh, a minister uh, in uh, April 2014. Uh, then the minister uh, said that he received letter last week from Benzingi that Benzingi doesn't want the minister to give uh, NRD tags. Benzingi signed as managing director of NRD. NRD said that it makes no sense if individual is sending letter and minister ignores a letter sent by the Minister of Justice in which the bailiff awards and judgments were suspended. Now, this is a representation coming from you. And you're referring there to the letter from Justice Minister suspending execution, correct? Yes, there was a letter which suspended the, 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 the seizures. But you were aware, weren't you, that by September 2014, and indeed on the 26th of August 2014, that suspension had been lifted and there was no suspension in place, correct? I really don't remember that, but I remember that there was a discussion that um, uh, because in 2014 the concessions were returned to the to the investors in NRD and not and from Benzinga to cost, uh, to to uh, investors in NRD, then uh, that was sufficiently clear uh, that it, the ownership was sorted out, right? Otherwise, they would not re uh, return it back to the original owners. You know, then they sh it should either stay with Benzinga or they should not give it to anybody and whatever. So if they gave it back to, to NRD investors, it meant that the issue of ownership was, was resolved. So then we should get the tax. That's the logical thing because uh, Mr. I uh, Imena always said, well, you know, I don't know who is the owner. So that was such a made up story, but this was another case when it was clear who is the owner. Just focusing on what you said, you said to the minister that it makes no sense if individual is sending letter and minister ignores a letter sent by Minister of Justice in which the bailiff awards and judgments were suspended. Uh, you were giving the misleading impression to Minister Imena, weren't you, that there was some current suspension of the awards and judgments. There was a suspension of the, yeah, yeah, there was a minister uh, of justice did suspend the seizure. But that suspension had long ago been lifted and you knew it. Not aware of that. Well, you were, weren't you? No, no. Can we go to bundle uh, R117? This is a minute of a meeting that you held with Mr. Imina and NRD representatives in December 2014. And if we look at the third paragraph of the letter, we can see that a Mr. Yassin of RMR Limited presented himself as holding 15% of shares. Do you recall that meeting? Yes, I do. And do you recall Mr. Yassin presenting himself as holding 15% of shares? Yeah, that was the plan to do, yes. Well, you say it was a plan to do, but it, representation was being made that he did hold 15% of shares. It was never said like that. Well, Mr. This, is the meet, this is the minute of the meeting. He presented himself, didn't he, as a holder of 15% of shares? No, 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 we didn't, we didn't present it that way. Uh, we presented it that there is a plan that Mr. Yassin would be a shareholder in the NRD. And that meant the government was being presented with a changing shareholding in the middle of reconsidering the license application, correct? Uh, that was a plan, and that's why we discussed it at the ministry to see how they would react to this, uh, to this option, to this possibility. But that's not what the minute shows because the minute shows he's presenting himself as a 15% shareholder. And then if we scroll down, you see that he's asking the ministry various questions from his perspective as shareholder. And it's clear from the minute, it's nothing to do with you gauging the ministry's reaction to his 15% shareholding. I don't think that these minutes are uh, reflecting exactly what was happening. Uh, he, it was a plan to have him as a shareholder. Uh, because there was no shareholder meeting yet, it was not held, it was not re uh, in reflected in the RDB uh, certificate, which is like a commercial register. So uh, nobody from the ministry would take that approach. They knew how companies are being registered. 
but you've just made up this idea that you were taking Mr. Yassin to the meeting to see how the ministry would react. This is not to make it like how, the, how they are going to react. This was introduced to the ministry like that's the plan because every change of share, shareholding must be agreed with the ministry. So this was one of the cases. Now, can we go to R189? Uh, this is a document from October 2015. And uh, you say there that the Rutsiro property is in the hands of the government. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, can you go to paragraph 22 of your witness statement? You say there that NRD remained in possession and control of the concessions until April, May, 2016. Now, those are two inconsistent statements. Which of those is true? Um, we received that letter. In two months, there should be some kind of uh, uh, handover of the concessions. As you are very well informed, it never happened. So we had a property in these concessions. So we had to guard it, we had to have people there, we had to do everything as, you know, uh, because if we were going to get the concessions back, we didn't want to have the equipment and everything what was there broken, right? So this was the limbo situation that we were taking care of the concessions. We have people there, we had security there, we paid them. And uh, now Jeffrey is asking me, if uh, I can sell it to him, right? If we can sell it to him. So, you know, that's a bad situation. You know, it, go and ask Mr. Evod if, you, if you, it's possible to sell it. You know, we, have, we are waiting either for the compensation or for the licenses. So now we are in the air. But at that point, as you knew, you had been asked to vacate the, possession, the concessions in May 2015, hadn't you? But why would you vacate something if you have their equipment, if you have their, your assets? So yeah. first you have to give the assets to somebody. Otherwise, you know, what will happen? Stolen, looted, whatever. That's why I was going to the, to the Mr. Gattares office all the time. Like, please tell me what we should do with these things. Should you, we like... You had been asked to vacate the concessions, hadn't you? And you spent your time in meetings with the minister at the time refusing to vacate the concessions and instead trying to hold out for a license. That's what really happened, isn't it? We couldn't vacate the, the assets there. That was valuable assets. So in the case we got the licenses back, we would be using these assets again. And your suggestion just... that you sat outside Mr. Guattari's office daily for almost two weeks is a wild exaggeration, isn't it? I swear to God, I was sitting there every day and I was hoping that somebody will come, he, his office will come and they will talk to me. The secretaries knew me, they knew that I'm all the time coming and they were very embarrassed about it, that he is hiding and it was not possible to meet him. Well, Mr. Guattari makes it clear uh, that he was not avoiding you. His time was heavily scheduled. All meetings were organized before time and put into his calendar. Uh, he's checked his calendar, he didn't meet with you and having checked your, his records, it, it appears you didn't even attempt to set up a meeting through the normal channels, and it's most unlikely you would have sat outside his office because his staff would have required you to make an appointment, and you never made that appointment. And that's fair. I made, that's lie, because I made the appointment every day when I was there. And the staff told me, please, Susanna, can you come tomorrow? He is at the cabinet meeting. He is in some meeting. Maybe he will come in the afternoon. I said, please, can you make an appointment for me so we can talk about these things? And they said, yeah, we will do when we see him, we will do. So if they ask him for the appointment, it seems that he didn't want to meet with me because we had several requests for the appointment there. Let's look at paragraph 26 of your witness statement now. You say there, the NRD member concession was taken from NRD in about May 2016 and awarded to a company with close ties to the military. There was no public tender and no information was available. That is all untrue, isn't it? That's absolutely true. Uh, we, we heard that in March, 
there will be the like tenders for these uh, concessions, NRD concessions. So we created a group of people who supposed to tender for, for Nemba and for Rutsira. These people, uh, we were not like, our names were not there. Uh, this group of people was told that don't touch this. Uh, Nemba is already promised to somebody. Then uh, I met Professor Nkanika, your witness, who also told me that he tried to apply for, for Nemba, uh, but he was told that don't do that. It's already promised to somebody. And as you know, Anthony Ellers did the same thing. So there was no public tender. All these applicants uh, which tried to tender for, for, for a NEMBA were uh, told, take back your applications. And in the end, the NEMBA concession was given to a, a company called Fair Construction, which was owned by a gentleman called Bob Mugisha, who was the family friend with the president. So that's now, why nobody could run it. Now, there's a number of points there. You say Mr. Ellers tendered, Mr. Orr tried to buy it. You're referring there to something that happened on your case in 2011, correct? That's a different application. The reality was there was a public tender and we've got lots of documents that establish that. And that's correct, isn't it? I would not believe these documents at all because I spoke with the real people, the real people who were really tendering and they were told not to do that. When you say there was no public tender, there was a public tender, yes? Our application was not allowed to tender for NEMBA. And that is also untrue, isn't it? That's, that's a very much truth. I have all the evidence showing you know, all the paperwork, how we pay the fees for the tender, everything. All the evidence you've just given about the tender process is simply untrue, isn't it? It's true, sir. It's very much true. And you can you just give me one moment. Just give me one moment, Miss Sure. You come on in paragraph 27 to say that in relation to the Western concession, that Nagali Mining is the owner of the mines. And that's not accurate either, is it? I say that I visited them in 2007 with a company belonging to the Ministry of Defence called Nagali Mining. Who is now the owner of the smelter. Right. So that's true. Many I was very you say Sorry? the owner of many mines. Are you suggesting that you're not suggesting it's the owner of, the, of any mines in the concessions? I'm talking here that we visited the, the Rutsiro plant. The largest sound around the region visited them in 2000, the company belonging to the Ministry of Defense called Mine Mining. And the owner of these uh, mines are smelter. That's right. Gali didn't know about the processing plant that then are rebuilt with the claimant's investment. And that uh, was why I came. I uh, are you or just let me just be clear? Are you or are you not alleging that Nagali mine that Nagali mining owns mines within the concessions, the former concessions of NRD? I think that they have some of the concessions, but this particular area which we visited uh, was turned into the military camp, so there was no mining. So you are alleging that Nagali mining owns concession owns some of the NRD concessions, are you? I didn't investigate it further. Truly, I didn't. Now, uh, you also refer in your witness statement to your belief about how much by way of minerals are smuggled out of DRC and into Rwanda, but you would accept, wouldn't you, that someone like Mr. Neon Saba, who works for the Itri Pat programme, 
is going to have detailed information on Rwanda's production levels. Yes? I think that uh, he has a propaganda information uh, because I traveled with uh, my expats, colleagues, mining engineer, geologists around Rwanda, and we were able to set up pretty, pretty clear baseline what the mines are producing. I am following it up to this day. The production of these mines were stable. Uh, they don't go up and down, except of Rutongo, which dropped dramatically. Yeah, the other mines keep their same half a container or uh, one container, whatever. So when you add all these companies together, there is no chance that Rwanda would have, without any investment, further investment, would have these growth. So the growth must come from somewhere. And Bruce, this is a pre-prepared and invented story, isn't it? And the person who actually knows the details on the ground is going to be someone like Mr. Neon Saba, whose job it is to investigate it, correct? I don't think that he does that. I don't think so. When uh, our tags were taken, I went to him and I said, well, Ildefonse, obviously the miners are mining there. So tell me who is tagging that minerals. And he says, oh, I don't know, Susanna. Maybe you know. And I said, no, Ildefonse, it's your job. It is your organization which has to find out what's happening in, in these areas. And he didn't, he didn't know, he didn't answer. Now, you refer at paragraph 25 uh, to an alleged threat of prison made to you by a senior police officer, and it's untrue, isn't it? Sir, it was a very awful experience I had in Rwanda. I was called to the police station and, uh, you know, to be called to police station in Rwanda, that's not a nice, uh, nice thing. So I called uh, several friends and people I knew to tell them that I'm going there. So in a case that, let's say, I told them, in two hours, if I'm not calling you back, please try to find out what's happening with me. And um, the suspicion was correct because these guys started to shout at me, I can put you to prison. You will never find a job. I will destroy your reputation. You know, it was like from a, like from a movie. So uh, then, then he says, like, yeah, and, and uh, Mr. Marshall, he made these dangerous people angry, so he shouldn't come back. It was a terrible experience, what I had. And I, I will never forget it, and I hope that it will never, ever happen to me or anybody else who is in Rwanda. I suggest you, you have made this up for the purposes of this arbitration. Not at all, not at all. It's, it's a true story. I was there, and this is what I was told, and this is what I experienced. And it was such a bad experience that I will never, ever forget it. Never. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Kovacova. You're welcome. No questions. Re-examination? Re no questions. I, I just have one question. Could you look, please, at paragraph 23 of your witness statement? Just read it to yourself and tell me when you've finished, please. Yes, sir. Is it correct that you met all these people? It's correct because it was so unbelievable what was happening, that it seems that there is a short somewhere. In some communication, something was not right. So what, what, what did you say to them? Sorry, sir. What did you say to them? I told them what's happening, that the company uh, what was uh, tried to be the, the correct investor in the country very uh, had the social program, try to do something for the miners. Uh, we were not like bad people who wanted to hurt Rwanda. We had even this pro bono work, which was done to Rwanda. So there was no reason why 
Rwanda would try to get rid of investor like this. That was even the reason why I stayed in Rwanda even later than I really needed after 2016. Because I I'm sorry, to... could, you, could you just um, confine yourself to my question? Yeah, so I met all these people and none of them basically said that they don't understand what's happening to NRD, why this is happening. What? So what everybody, did... sorry. Sorry, what did you ask them to do, if anything? No, 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 I just told them the story, what happened to NRD. And I, and, and I asked them like, if they can have a feedback, if they can tell us what is happening, uh, what, what is behind the scene, if somebody knows something, why this company is treated this way, why this industry is treated this way. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. You're, you're now free to go. Thank you very much. 15 minute break. Yes. Thank All right, you. we're going to go ahead and open up the breakout rooms. All right, Mr. President, I'm going to go off camera and, and wait to hear to yes. bring the witness in. Yes, could the witness be brought in, please? Certainly. Mr. Fiala, welcome. Thank you. Uh, you will see on your screen, I think, a declaration. Would yeah, I've seen, I've seen everybody, only you have all of you bigger head than me. <laughs> you can fix it, I'm feeling diminished. Uh, do you see the declaration on your screen? Yeah, declaration. 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 On, on, oh, you have a screen. I am solemnly yes. Would you be kind enough to read it? Yeah, I, I, I solemnly declare in my honor and conscience that I shall speak the truth and whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Mr. Fiala, yes. can you? Could you tell the tribunal your name and, and your your occupation? Well, my name is uh, Jaroslav Fiala. I'm called Jerry. And what was the second? And your occupation, Mr. Fiala. Occupation. Just I I I am Czech and Australian citizen, and I lived in Rwanda. And what were you doing in Rwanda, Mr. Fial? In Rwanda, I'm from uh, 2003. I'm involved in uh, mining and exploration. And what, what was your role in the mining and exploration industry? I did, uh, actually I came to Rwanda as consulting geologist for South African company metallurgical design and management. And you're, you're muted. I think we are muted. Yeah. Mr. Fowler, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, I apologize. Um, and I understand Mr. Fowler, at some point, uh, you were involved or owned a company called Rwanda Rudniki. Is that yes. correct? Yes, uh, uh, this uh, company was incorporated in 2006 in Rwanda. And just very br briefly, what, what was your role with the company? No, major role I picked, uh, picked in a man's what uh, can be described as my intellectual property. Mr. Mr. I, I apologize. I'm not sure I heard 
what you said. Um, so I'm just going to re-ask the question. If you could just state what your role was with Rwanda Rudiki. What were you doing for the no, company? Uh, first year, I was searching for concession. And then, then I became director of company. And, <clears throat> and I was running this company until I did John Venture with these guys from Hong Kong. And in, in what years were you running the company? This uh, company was incorporated 2006. I've got concession in uh, 2007, in uh, early 2007. And uh, in November 17, 2007, I did joint venture with, uh, with uh, Neotan and uh, I was running alone this company up to 2009, 2010. Thank you, Mr. Fiala. No other questions. Yes, Mr. Hill. Thank you, Mr. Fiala. Um, you say in your witness statement that you're the holder of a small scale mining license on behalf of Rwanda Ridniki. Can you just explain what you mean by that? No. <clears throat> uh, I did one year research and uh, mapping, geological mapping and, and sampling, and I designed perimeter of concessions and then apply for concessions. And who is the concession holder? Concession holder was uh, uh, Rwanda Rudniki. Uh, so the company holds a concession and you are in fact, although you describe yourself as, as the holder of a small scale mining license on behalf of Rwanda Rudniki, you are in fact a minority 15% shareholder. No, in but... Uh, Initially, I have 51 percent. But now you're a minority 15 percent shareholder, yes? From 2010, yeah. So you're not the holder of the license on behalf of Rwanda Rudniki, are you? No. no. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to answer, but uh, I was working on this concession until 2014, when I was dismissed from company. Yes. And could you go to R185? Say it again. Uh, then, sorry, you're going to be shown a document on a screen, which will be for FTI. It's going to be R185. This. Can we come back? This is a notification to the RDB from Rwanda. Ridniki, uh, could we just scroll out a bit, please, FTI? From Rwanda Ridniki, yeah, warning, but... warning the RDB of false representations of ownership being yeah, made by you. This document I never seen before. Right, it's a document from October fourteen, and it's from Rwanda Ridniki to the uh, RDB. That's the Rwanda Development Board. Yeah, I, I, in this uh, date, I was not, uh, I was dismissed for company and I have no access to premises and offices of company and this letter never been delivered to me. And uh, what's, what's said in the second paragraph is that at present, Mr. Fiala occupies no uh, offices within the company. Mr. Fiala has... Uh, no authority from the company to act for or to represent the company in any manner. As can be noted below, as is confirmed by the valid RDB certificate attached, Mr. Fiala is a minority shareholder. And as such, Mr. Fiala has no legal path to give himself any authority without the agreement of the other shareholders. And that was correct, wasn't it, in October uh, 2014? Yeah, yeah they, they can write what they like, but i never seen it before. I actually ask RDB approximately after this date 
to confirm that my concessions are my intellectual property because government did on my concession um, detailed survey for about maybe million dollars and uh, my perimeter was precisely the same like uh, what was from all this big research but they they didn't answer me and uh, this letter going back to this letter it was written because if you look at the first paragraph it was being said that you were misrepresenting your ownership interest in Rwanda Rudniki to at least one bank and to the RDB. And is that that's what is that what was happening? No, never. You said bank. Yes, misrepresenting ownership interest in Rwanda Rudniki to at I, least one I, bank. During this peri period, I never enter company premises. I never talk to any bank. I, I actually, when I only have, they they locked my twenty thousand US dollars in bank, and, and I ask uh, to be released. But uh, I don't know if it is the same case. And you were removed as director of the company because the company considered you were misusing funds and misrepresenting the company's financial <laughs> information. Correct? <laughs> well, I well, never seen it. Sorry, I couldn't. Couldn't accept it. Now, can we go to R186? Another document will come up on the screen, which is R186. This is a commercial court judgment, <clears throat> which is dealing with the question of whether you were entitled to represent uh, the company. And can you go to page four of that document? And you'll see the court's decision starts at paragraph 15. And it, the court confirmed that paragraph 16, that you were not the director of Rwanda Ridniki uh, and uh, that your directorship had been uh, come to an end by general me in general meeting. Yes? There I, I was director of company, but I myself, I myself sign document because they put a lot of money into company that, that I agree that I have only 15%. On this basis, they, they uh, dismissed me as, uh, as the general director and it was recorded in the Rwanda board, development board. I, I did it by myself. I nobody showed me this letter. I agreed what was agreed for a whole time. I was director that I they invested money and then I will be diluted to 85%. And I sign it. By the way, I sign it when I apply for a visa. I needed a certificate of company that I am in company to have visa in in Rwanda. And by the way, this Boni Banza, which is here, he threatened me that if I don't sign it, that my visa will be cancelled and I will be evicted from Rwanda. I was in your, enormous pressure. In your supplemental witness statement, you say that you have reviewed an Excel spreadsheet created by ITRI. Now, do you know on what basis you say that you've been looking at an Excel spreadsheet created by ITRI? I don't know if it was Excel spreadsheet, but uh, uh, audit of Rwanda Rudniki were free available on website. And I, I found this, uh, I found this, uh, uh, actually it was called ITRI audit. I found it on, on internet. When I show it to my to my friends, shareholders, they immediately ask Itri to, to stop publication of these documents. No. Uh, I, I, 
I, it was available on site, online. No, so you found something online, but you have no basis for thinking it's an actual ITRI document, do you? No, it was definitely ITRI document. It was called ITRI audit, and it was signed by, by ITRI people. Well, we have the document attached, which has been provided that you refer to in your witness statement, and it doesn't have any of that information on it. So that's not, that's not correct, is it? Yeah, so I gave all these documents, including other audit from 2013, because uh, Rwanda uh, Rwanda uh, how is called this institution, Rwanda they, they issued audit every year, company issued every year. I have all audits, but this one I I found on, on online freely available to everybody. And uh, let's go to paragraph five of your witness statement. Yeah. Your first witness statement. You say there that under its 2007 contract for acquiring licenses, NRD. Uh, had the right to the concessions. Yeah, but sorry, you, you now slipped from uh, Rwanda Rudniki to, to NRD. Yes, I moved on. Yeah, could you could you repeat it? I yes, guess? go to paragraph five of your witness statement. And I originally had up the supplemental witness statement. My apologies. All right, let's okay, let's all start again. Paragraph five of the witness statement. You say there, it's on the screen. I hope it's on the screen. Under it, do you see in the third sentence, under its 2007 contract for acquiring mining licenses, NRD and its investors had a right to the concessions. Now, have you reviewed that 2007 contract? Yeah, I've seen uh, nearly all documents which, uh, which NRD have in office until until they from time to time lock locked the offices and there no access. But uh, I am sure that, that they issued many many mining act 2007 2008 2015. I I would not recall all details of it. But but, but what I think they they were rightful. For, for, for me, they were rightful owners because they paid a lot of money for concessions. And what their rights were depended on the terms of the 2007 uh, contract, yes? Sorry, 2006 contract. Yeah, there was some problem between 2000 and then 2007. Yes, I think you mean 2006 contract, don't you? Or do you, or do you think there's some, some other contract? In 2007. Do you think there's some contract in 2007 that you had in mind? No, but uh, actually, uh, this is a long time ago. I, I will not re recall all details, sorry. And you don't recall the terms of the contract either, do you? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I did application for them for reapplying for concessions in detail, but, uh, but this document I can't recall. Yes, so you're not able to help us now on the terms. I think it was 2007 because, because there was, according to legislation, 2007. But what rights NRD had obviously depended on the terms of that contract, correct? Yes, yes, they they actually operating uh, this concession. So for me, actually, they had to own it, and they have some letters from government. They let it to operate, but uh, sometimes they suspended it for a year, one year. You see, they systematically ruin their business. Now, do you were you under the impression that uh, NRD had an existing license? Yes, I it made. In 2014, I was absolutely sure because 
because they they were some way cancelled and they asked me for prepare business plan and, and geology and maps to reapply for this concession. I remember this time their office were locked and we couldn't get all the documents. But were you not aware that their license had actually expired when they were asked to reapply for the concession? Uh, I was, uh, my impression was that it was cancelled by government. If they expired, that is, that is other matter, I, I'm not sure. So that was what... Large, large mining concession in Rwanda is valid 25 years. And they have a very large one. So were you, so we're just what, what was your understanding about the status of their license when they applied in 2014? Some way is cancelled and they must reapply. Do you recall this in any detail, Mr. Fiala? Say it again. Say it do, you, again. do you remember this in any detail? Mm -hmm. Look, uh, when, when, when the minister said that they must reapply, then they NRD came to me because I work on concession uh, many years. Actually, 2013, I was on concessions uh, living and working seven months. So I have more material. They asked me to, to prepare business plan for, for reapplication. So yeah. in this moment, my impression was that, that concession was cancelled by government. And were you aware that the government had requested that the application for, a, for a new licenses be made on a concession by concession basis? In other words, a different application for each concession. Were you aware of that? Uh, we, I have map of all, all Western concessions in Nemba, and I remember when uh, Government was saying they have concession too big that uh, they they dropped uh, Musha Abisesero and uh, and uh, I didn't study too much why they lost lost concession or I just write business plan. Now, uh, in terms of the exploratory work that was described in the application in 2014. Yes. Now, uh, you make comments on how good it was compared to other applications. Now, the minister and the ministry will have reviewed all applications, yes? Not just no, the ones you've worked on, but all applications. Please, yes. Please, my, I have no no idea. My work finished when I passed to NRD report. What they did with this, I I was not my business. But in terms of assessing and comparing that, yeah, I, I, if you, I wrote I wrote in many many reports and documents and statements that this concession were one of the best in Rwanda. Actually, they were owned by NRD Stark Germany. They spent on this concession 17 million euro. And it was quite a lot of document to understand that these concessions are exceptionally good. But in terms of comparing that application with other applications, yep. then yep. if you just listen to my question just for a moment, yep. in terms of making the comparison yep. between that application and other applications. Yes, I would say I would say that most of application was done for money by employees of Ministry of Mines and Forestry. And uh, they they have such sort of uh, content, they wrote it, but not too much work in, in the field. It was just formality. But the assessment... This one, this one was behind. This one was 17 million spent by NRD Stark 
and I spent I spent years to to do geology research. By the way, there's not many deposits in in Rwanda which have reserves. But the, the ministry was well placed. Was it was their normal position to judge and assess the different applications, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I have no idea. I, I I never got any information what they judged. Now, there are about a thousand mining sites in Rwanda, aren't there? No, of which about three hundred are being actively mined. It's about five hundred. 25 concessions, I don't know, recent couple of years ago, 525 concessions. But about a thousand mining, about a thousand mining sites, of which 300 or so are being actively mined. Yes? Yeah, you, know, you see some successful, successful venture, it's about five or six, which making money and, and uh, having some profit and can invest. But the others, uh, most of deposit is small or very small, and they are worked by artisans, which, which you see, have limited, uh, limited capacity to do something. For example, they can mine only 40 meters from surface, and so on. So, um, and across those sites, the Rwandan Mining Board and ITSKI have field officers, don't they, who visit the sites and may check on production and investigate incidents. Yes? Uh, they have inspectors, which uh, certainly visiting, and I, I was many times accompanying them on, on my time session. They were visiting regular site and writing a report, which sometimes have many, many pages. And each each mine had some some notes what what uh, is happening with the environment and its mining and and I don't know some some survey. And the, and they're building up that picture across all the mines across the country, aren't they? They, they did it. They did it. Yeah, they did it uh, regularly. I think once or maybe twice a year. Each inspector had province and they, 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 it is job. And that gives them an overview, doesn't it, of levels of production across the different mines across the country? <laughs> so, no. So what you would like to know about this? Level from production, Rwanda produced in 2014, 50% of world production of coltan, tantalum. What do you think about it? Right. It is it is it is well well on internet research. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fiala. Mr. Fiala, I leave to the last question that Mr. Hill asked. Um, you testified that levels of production in Rwanda were. In 2014, were 50%. Um, can, you, can you explain where the other 50% is coming from? No, yes, uh, yes, and no, because, but I know the major producing country of Coltan are not, not only Rwanda, but also DRC, Burundi, Nigeria, Brazil. And uh, is, did, did I say Australia again? Thank you, Mr. Fiala. No further questions. Thank you very much for coming to assist us. You're now free to leave. Thank you, sir. We're going to have an early day, are we, Mr. Hill?
It looks like it. I imagine my next witness is not available, and I'm certainly happy to stop. To stop. You have to That's stop, correct. Mr. Carney. We are happy to stop, and we do not have a next witness ready to start. So it's an early day. Thank you very much. Then we will adjourn until midday tomorrow. Thank you.